live. Cool. Hey, everybody. 5.15, right on time. Is there any everybody's out there? <laughs> really not. I need to load up the comments. Um, yeah, sorry about the delay there. Had a little uh, technical issues. Unbelievable. Unacceptable, really. But Who are we blaming? Um, Mountain Lion. OSX the Mountain Lion. That's right. You heard it here first. We're giving OSX Mountain Lion a terrible review. I had a I had an app that we use for the recording that makes everything work, and it decided it wasn't going to work. I don't know why it worked last week. Perfectly fine. Uh, this yeah, week that's... it magically broke. And I looked on some online forums, and I'm not the only one experiencing this issue. Unfortunately, I recognized it literally five minutes before we started, because why would I test things ahead of time? That makes no sense. So, Makes no sense to me. So there you go. All right, man. Start cool. it up. Let's do it. All this. right. Welcome to episode 45 of the Furlough Bros Tech Podcast. Today is... Uh, what is today? Can I start again? <laughs> today is the August. Do whatever you want. Cool. I'm going to... Yeah, one second. Uh, welcome to episode 45 of the Furlough Bros Tech Podcast. Today is August the 5th, 2012. I am Matthew Dean Furlough, and this is my fellow Martian slash world fastest man, James Furlough. Hey, it's me. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't quite decide... Whether I'm more excited about us landing on Mars again today or Usain Bolt being insane Bolt. Um, <laughs> and I've, I, I, I know how it ended, but I don't know who else knows how. Well, okay, do we have anybody actually listening live right now? No. Since we're, it. It's at a weird time. Okay, so Usain Bolt totally won, set a new Olympic record. Oh, my goodness, I'm so excited. Wow. Yeah. He's pretty fast. Oh, yeah, especially since he ran, like, a 10-second 100-meter during his qualifying. <laughs> oh, that guy's great. He's He is my favorite. I'm, uh, That's I'm, slow, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. He, okay, yeah. just checking, because that sounds pretty the, fast to me, the, personally. <laughs> the, only, the only guy that ran... He ran slow. 100 meters in 10 seconds. Wow. <laughs> The only guy that ran slower than that during the actual final was a guy who pulled his muscle. <laughs> he pulled his hamstring. <laughs> and you want to know what's crazy? The dude with the pulled hamstring halfway through the race still ran a 12-second 100-meter. <laughs> still beat me. That's amazing. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think I've ever moved that fast in my... I know I've never moved that fast in my entire life because we timed... Not without a car. Was, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he had a top speed of 27.4 miles per hour. He's he's nuts. He's, he's wow. a human. That guy's my favorite. And he made twenty million dollars last year. I wish I I texted out or I tweeted out earlier today. I <laughs> to, Usain Bolt. Well, let me let me read the let me read the actual. Um, and then I'm actually gonna play right off of that because I got a story related to numbers. All right. I said Usain Bolt earned twenty million dollars last year. I wish I was faster than everybody to, else too. <laughs> Guys yeah, no doubt. So apparently you weren't the only one watching that uh, because NBC's shared some numbers yeah. on their, uh, you know, streaming and stuff like that. Um, yeah. They've already delivered 34 million live stream videos. I'm guessing to everybody um, but me. To everybody but you. Yeah, not me. Um, through August 2nd, which is more than the entire Beijing Olympics in 2008. Holy cow. That's cool. Yeah. And so they've, and they've um, for satellite, cable, and teleco TV, which is somehow different. What is that? Eh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, they've registered 6.2 million devices um, to log in to look at the coverage. That's amazing. Yeah. Ugh. it's um, So they're having, like, way up numbers, basically. Uh, which I think means, despite the whole like time shift issues and failures, um, they're gonna keep doing it for a while. I think yeah. I think that's the way to interpret that, right? It was super successful. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're about as far off as you can get. They're ten hours off from us, and yet people are still watching. So it can literally happen on the other side of the planet, and people will pay attention. 
Yeah. Yeah. It says that they've, on average, um, let's see here, on mobile, they watched on average um, 85 minutes of video. Yeah. And on the web, 58 minutes. Oh man, that's Wait, cool. That, no, no, I'm sorry. On the web, it's 85, and on mobile apps, it's 58. I got those reversed. I was gonna, I was gonna be really surprised by that, but you know what, James? I actually want to talk about this more in depth. Do you want to know that? Do you want to know the number one? No, this was a legitimate article, man. Do you want to know the number I, I one know, um, streamed event? Yeah, tell me. Women's gymnastics. Nice. It was their um, gold medal final. With the fi- the flying squirrel, Gabby Giffords. Is that that's her name, right? I, I think sure. That's her name. Yeah, she's well, pretty. Already said it. I don't have access, so I don't know any of this stuff. She was pretty amazing. I've I've she's been watching. To sleep. I've been watching it on the horrible, horrible, horrible NBC evening broadcast where they cut all the emotional stuff that doesn't fit their narrative. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> quite obnoxious. Um, anyways, yeah. we're going to continue to talk about all this stuff uh, and because we do this every week. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is the continuing corporate opera or the soap opera of corporations dealings back and forth, occasionally Olympics, um, the people working for them, their marketing campaigns, and the technology they're developing, um, and also Mars a little bit. So before we get too much further into the show, James has a short disclosure he wants to go through. Uh, I work for the Hewlett Packard. However, I do not represent the Hewlett Packard or any of the Hewlett Packard's opinions. So I should always say I when referring to the Hewlett Packard things. Um, and I should never say, like, we when referring to the Hewlett Packard things. All right. I appreciate that. As I mentioned earlier, I tweet funny stuff throughout the week, and uh, so does James, and so does. And, and like, let's say you want to watch live, and then for some freak reason, uh, the Furlough Bros Tech podcast has to uh, air three hours earlier than normal. You want to know where you'll get that information? You're going to get it on the tweeter. Um, my personal handle is at Matthew D. Furlow. And I am at James Furlow. And the show where uh, show critical information is distributed is at Furlow Bros. Um, um, that actually is not 100% accurate, to quote a guy from Independence Day. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't... Uh, you know, they're like, believe me, sir, there's no such thing as Area 51. And yeah, so no, I know. I, I got the okay, reference. You got the quote. I'm confused. Oh, one. okay. I was just saying that it's nowhere on furtherbros.com that I mentioned that uh, this show is going to be three hours no, no. earlier. I said the tweeter, the Twitter. Twitter. Oh, I thought you said... I said at furloughbros, which is oh, our Twitter right. handle. Yeah. I, I, you mean I have to listen to you. Okay, got yes. it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, because... But, you know, if you, if you just want cool information throughout the week, all our clicks, links, and everything we talk about on this show, um, any articles you want to painstakingly tear through to criticize us on, uh, those can all be found on furloughbros.com. You can also communicate with us there. That's the, that's the real hub. And, of course, you don't see, forget You to- see, I like the way, the way I think about it is, what if you're writing a critical review of the technology landscape this last week? We would be a resource for that. Exactly. Or if you're just, you know, interested. It's yeah. good. Let's do. We we scour the internet for interesting articles of the week, and then we give them to you. We mm-hmm. don't just talk about them. Mm-hmm. We give you links. We are can, we are participating in the interconnectivity of the worldwide network that is the internet. Um, so yeah, check us out there. It's pretty cool. I had a um I had a friend uh today. He comes up to me and goes, Hey, you know about iPhone stuff? He goes, I got a friend thinking about getting the new iPhone. And I, my answer, I, without even the rest of it, I went, end of September, probably going to be shipping early October at the latest. Yes, it's worth waiting for. September like, 12th and 21st. He oh, was like, on. well, <laughs> you right. know, I just want to, ple- I want to pleasantly surprise them. Ah, uh, okay. Um, but anyways, but, uh, but he was like, all right, good conversation. Exactly what I want to know. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. <laughs> oh. we, we are here to help, guys. You want to know, you want to know what the insiders know? I have Apple employee friends. I live in Silicon Valley. I drive through Cupertino. None of that actually gives me inside information because most of the employees don't know themselves and they don't post it on billboards. But I do read a lot <laughs> because of that. I do. I've, <laughs> I've, I've come to a pretty good conclusion on um, what day stuff is happening. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's so. funny. That's funny. All right, man. With that, let's talk about the news. Um, cool, cool. We got a, we got a bunch of really cool stuff, and um, since we do have to wrap up at a reasonable hour, because I'm going to my the final softball game of the season. Go. Yeah. We're the, Phantom um, monkeys. We're the uh, steamrolling Phantom monkeys. I like it. So it's a picture of a monkey on a steamroller. Nice. Uh, yeah, I. I came up with the Phantom Monkeys part, and someone else liked the steamrolling, so that's how it, <laughs> that's how it happened. Um, that's what is that? Uh, that's decision by committee, right there. Exactly. Um, yep, yep, yep. So uh, here is a, it. Sounds like a decision probably not made by a committee. The the Daily, which is the iPad only newspaper by News Corp. Robert Robert Rupert Murdoch's, um, you know. I'm not going to call it a pet project, but an experiment. You know, yeah, and that, it's been insanely popular, right? I mean, like, everybody reads it? Uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> I think everyone who works there reads it. <laughs> Which is um, No, no, no. They say that they have, they have more than 100,000 paying subscribers. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, but it hasn't quite lived up to expectations, a la being profitable. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, you know. So to fix that, um, they're going to be letting go of 50 of their 170 employees. Which Whoa. At first I was like, 170 employees? Holy cow, what are they doing? And um, But but I'm going to put a positive spin on this, okay? Because they've had it out for 18 months. They've got 100,000 subscribers. And what it sounds like to me is that they've learned some stuff. Like, for example, yeah. um, they're not going to be doing... Uh, um, they used to have like an, an editorial section just all on its own, yeah. and and they're getting rid of that altogether. They're going to instead like embed thoughts within the actual sections. Interesting. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, another thing is they're getting rid of their sports sections. Um, it says it somewhere and now. I can't find it, but that's okay. Um, because what they found was that people just didn't read about sports on you know casually. On the on the daily, uh, you know, if they wanted sports news, they had their ESPN app and they were getting say. you know instant, you know what I mean. So they're just like, we just didn't need that. Uh, another shocking. thing, and this is why I think that they're what they're doing is they're learning and making good decisions. Is they're getting rid of the um, they're going portrait, what is it? Portrait only. They're getting rid of the landscape option, because what they found through their studies, they're like most people, and I'm guessing a high percentage of them only watch uh, or only read it in the vertical layout. We're like, so we're spending all this time trying to format things to work for both, and they're like, we're not going to do that anymore. We'll just format it for the one. Call it good. And most people will never even notice that we made that change because they don't even choose to. So to me, what it sounds like is they went, you know what, we, we, try, we put a whole bunch of stuff on the wall. Some things have stuck and some things haven't. And so what we're going to do is we're going to keep the things that are working. Um, and we're going to drop the things that aren't, which means we can shed some employees, hopefully get to some profitability as a result of that, and make it work. The nice part is is like they have, you know, they know how much they're making right now because they have mm -hmm. number of su subscribers. They know how many they gain every month, how many they lose every month, and they know how much money that's bringing in. So they have like a really focused amount of, you know, they know, they can start to predict their financials, and when you're talking about a, you know, they're, they're not printing newspapers. They've got, they've probably got a building that they're in, but it's like they have a number of fixed costs that go along with what they're doing, but probably the biggest thing that they can play with is employees, which is, you know, I'm, I've been laid off. That's not fun. I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to suggest that, but as an entity, uh, you gotta, you know, they're cutting where they can cut, and I, I doubt that what they're going to do is they're going to make it so that they have to lay off more people later. You know, you always. That's always the goal. Yeah, the goal is that you're now profitable, and hopefully, you know, unless something turns around and it gets worse, uh, you'll, you'll be able to do it. But the cool part about this, you, you, what's unique is like. How would you ever know if you're like, let's say you have a traditional newspaper and half the pages are in portrait, half of them are in line, landscape. 
because you're just trying out a new style. You know, how would you as a publisher ever know what people prefer? Whereas on this one, you can just like add a little apps and you can say, yeah, we know nobody looks at this. We mm -hmm. know people look at it this way. You know, it allows them to hyper focus. I actually, I think that it's, you know, I, I think this is a good sign. And, and, you know, the fact that they're not canceling the project means that, you know, they still have, they still have uh, faith in it and, they want it to go forward. So that's yeah, cool. their final um, statement, quote, is that the changes announced today at The Daily will enable the business to operate more efficiently and with ever greater focus on the types of content that consumers have gravitated toward since its launch. News Corporation remains committed to The Daily and the publication will continue to be an important part of our leading portfolio of published brands going forward or publishing brands going forward. So yeah, I look at it in... I think that last part's kind of you know you got to say that, but uh, but I totally agree with there. It'll make them you know more efficient. It'll save money. I think is the real word here. Um, but it's to give greater focus towards the types of content that consumers have naturally gravitated towards. And if it makes yeah. that type of content better, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool, so cool. they're laying off people, but I uh, you know I. We hear about other layoffs, you know, like RIM and Yahoo and HP and stuff like that. And I honestly, you just sit there and go, they need to cut money. They don't know how to do it. This is one way they're going to do it, and they're going to figure it out. You know, you don't feel like there's a real plan behind what's going on. Right. Whereas this one, they did a really good job, and maybe it's because it's a smaller organization they can do it. They did a really good job of saying, here's what we've learned. Therefore, here are the changes that we're making. And yes, this is going to result. One of the things is layoffs, but we're also doing these other things. This is just a component of the plan. And yeah, I like it, that. Other companies should do that too. Take note. Right. Seriously. Yeah, it feels like a good plan. I got gotcha. you. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, I'm um, I have a question, James. Yeah. Uh, so for Windows 8, they've got their new UI style. Do you know what it's yeah. being called? Um, in my article title. <laughs> well, I um, don't. I have read other stuff about it. Okay. I, I don't know what would it be called. I would call it Metro personally. That sounds cool. Well, I would call I would call it Metro because that's what Microsoft has been calling it ever since Windows Seven Mobile came out. Um, yeah. So yeah, it turns out they don't own that uh, that name, and Oops. somebody else does, and they're not excited about it. So. And the best part took about a while this was, to uh, say something. Yeah, or was it, it just it, going through the cases that long? I, I have a feeling know, the that they've. I have a feeling that they made a big deal out of it, and I think I, you know, it's it's probably a classic uh, Jobs t style thing that Ballmer tried to pull off, where you just start calling it what you're going to call it, and then go, oh, we'll just work it out with them later. And the company that they went up against turned out to be this like huge European company with electronic stuff and that's like the name oh, of their what? company. And so <laughs> they were like, uh no, you're not just going to buy this from us. Whereas, you know, in the past Apple has always just bought product names and stuff. Um so yeah, it turns out that uh Microsoft is gonna lose that one and uh they officially they've sent out emails and notes to all of their employees um, and quite a few of their developers saying, yeah, let's not call it Metro anymore. And uh, it sounds like what what happened internally was they used Metro as part of the uh, – it's just sort of a, uh, uh, a code name for it, and it just kind of evolved yeah, into the lie. actual name for it. Yeah, seriously. And that's what they're, that's what they're telling everybody. And, uh, yeah. So. I guess I, I could see that, right? You started off as a code name. It actually sounds cool. You use it once or twice for, you know, outside stuff, and other people are like, ooh, that sounds cool, and you just you never even think to check. I, yeah. I could. I, I guess I, I I'm, see that, I'm, I I'm actually willing to believe it. It sounds like the sort of thing that, well, it's just one of those, like, could you, I mean, I, it just seems crazy to me that, that you wouldn't even Google Metro, you know, and just, just to make sure. Nobody else already owns that yeah. one, <laughs> you know. It just seems like a ridiculous oversight um, for major. Or maybe campaign. they were like, "We'll we'll be like Apple. We will use the word iPhone or FaceTime, and we'll figure it out." <laughs> well, and you the know? thing is, and maybe they did do that, but I have a but 
if you really think that Apple hasn't fig picked their battles on that one, I'm sure that there's names that they've wanted that they've saw, seen other companies, bigger companies have, and they've kind of, uh, uh, yeah, we're not going to try to own that one. They pick on things that they think they can win, um, you know, by just buying them out. You know, it's it's like winning the lottery for small people who, small companies who own names that are, you know, are and the other thing is is that Apple tends to you know I mean just the fact that they've never gone up against anybody who's copyrighted a name for the purpose of trying to bottle Apple in you know anytime somebody you know if anybody bought iPad Mini which well wasn't it like well didn't they've had some stuff right like Cisco owned what was it FaceTime well but and well what it was a Chinese mean? thing for iPad or something but I don't think those companies bought them out of they bought them to try to try to maneuver the I think they like legitimately right, had these right. products like, yeah. and and Apple just said, well we're gonna go for it. Whereas there's like there is a bun there are a bunch of people out there who like buy domain names, buy names totally specifically trying to get there before Apple and I and Apple's never bought one from those people. And I think it's because Apple realizes okay. that if we do that once, it'll just be an all out gold rush, you know, for looking for who's gonna win the lottery next. And so they only pick you know, they've they're so there, there is. They've never. They, they always buy them from the same type of people when there's a name they want, which suggests to me that they're very purposeful. You know, they, they're very careful when they're looking for those names, and they just figure that they can win in the end. You know, I, with a certain size company, and you just kind of, oh, that's cool. We're gonna get a couple million dollars. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you know. But. So it says that they're, um, they're expected to announce a replacement name. Right now, they're using new user interface and Windows 8-style UI, which is yeah, it's dumb. awful. Um, they give a couple guesses. One of them could be Courier as a new name. Another one, um, Windows Live Mesh Tiles Plus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, courier yeah, would be bad. That would courier like, would be bad? I think so. Because because uh, Courier was, was the name of that vaporware that they announced to try to to you know, head off the the iPad when it was coming out, and just mm. immediately oh, yeah, right. anybody anybody who's paying attention immediately goes, oh yeah, that failed project. You know? Well, you know they do have the Surface, so um, yeah, that's they're that's not a, they're point. not immune to that. They know they own that one, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they might they might so, be safe. Yeah, that's funny. I don't know what I would call it. Live yeah. tiles. Live tiles. mesh tiles. That's the, let's let's face it, though. This is the thing that that disappoints me. The chances that I think Metro is a good name. Um, it's you know it's it it has that whole like oh it's kind of futuristic you know it like I it calls it immediately and maybe this is just me but it immediately calls to calls to mind metropolis you know metropolitan very chic very fashion forward very futuristic and yeah. You know, it's a great name for what they're trying to do. The chances that they come up with another great name like that, just just next to zero. <laughs> it's, there's no way, um, which is kind of disappointing. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But whatever, it's fun while it lasted. You know, maybe the only nice thing is is that that it might, even though it might not, and and this is this might. I don't know if this is. Uh, uh, too clever by half, but um, that might have been one of those things where. Th Did you just say too clever by half? Yeah, you've never heard that phrase. Before? That no, I haven't. No, yeah, it's, just, it's just too clever. You know, it's it's clever, but it's just okay. It's just a little further than it should be. But it's like I, I it almost is like everybody calls it Metro style now. I wonder if their thought was it doesn't really matter if we call it that as long as everybody else is calling it that. Uh, okay. That name will be in the popular, you know, it'll become, people will just call it that. It doesn't matter who owns it. Um, but I don't know if that's... I just, it should be the Windows style, Windows 8 style UI formerly known as Metro. That's it should be formerly Metro. Formerly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, oh, funny. We'll see. Poor Microsoft. Can't ever get a break. <laughs> they got to <Yeah>. learn it. <laughs> oh, well. So uh, I was reading, as I tend to do, about tech stuff, and I, I saw a really cool article on TechCrunch called Irreducible. Um, and I love the opening line of this. It says, the future is in apps you don't open. 
Hmm. And I and the and the very next line, it's from this guy. He does a new photos app called Flock, which I know nothing about because um, I didn't click on that link. <laughs> um, it says we're going to move away from the era of I have hundreds of apps, but I never think of using them. Towards I have these cool apps, and they take care of me. Right. And the idea being that right now we're in a stage where you you have apps on your phone. I do. You don't because you have a dumb phone. Um, where in order to use them, you have to do an additional task. Okay. So for example, Foursquare, you arrive to a venue, you have to check in, which means you got to pull your phone out of your pocket, you got to open the app, got to you know select your venue, maybe write a status, share, whatever. You know, you have to you have extra steps involved in doing it. And you know, and in all reality, that gets old pretty fast. You know, if, especially if all it is is a novelty. Yeah. Um, you know, that's it. And and his point is that you know, eventually, you know, that's cool. And but you're adding these steps. But eventually, it should get to a point where, as a matter of fact, it it saves you from having to do things. Um, I guess the equivalent example would be. You arrive to a venue. Um, not only does it automatically check you in, but if you have friends nearby, it automatically sends them a notification and hmm. maybe invites them to come over or something like that. Uh, you know, something like that, right? Where it it saves you time, basically. Um, and then he goes on to say, and and it might even take time for uh, things like Google Glass to really make it so that you. Um, you know, so that you can just be and let the app do its thing, because now the app can see what you're seeing, and you can do some real, um, you know, some passive stuff. This sounded really a lot cooler when I was reading it. Um, <laughs> saying it out loud does not require. I mean, so well, I, I don't want to just read this thing, but it says that it centers around the idea that apps shouldn't force us to add new behaviors. Instead, they should strip away needless, interrupted steps from themselves and the way we live our lives until the solutions to our problem become literally irreducible. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in at this point. I actually, I, I kind of like this idea. Um, one of the things, uh, oh, what the heck? I'm, I'm busting out my, uh, uh, my iPod Touch, which has apps, so I can um, share my insights. But it's like the the, the mass, vast majority of, of apps that I use are entertainment apps, games essentially, or you know like um, or uh, Netflix, something well, like that. Well, and this guy he gives an example of Bump, right? Where all you do is w it's when you meet someone, it reduces the friction of getting information. You literally bump your phone with them and and you got the information. Where you know, instead of fiddling with business cards and having to literally like type stuff in, he's like, you know, that reduced the uh, you know the amount of effort and work required to not necessarily meet somebody, but to get someone's information after you met right. them. Right. Well, and what I was going to say is, my, I think one of my first my first reactions is, this is obviously someone who is envisioning this on on Android because. You know, one of the big problems with with iOS right now, or one of its strengths, however you want to look at it, um, is that it doesn't allow that sort of behind the scenes omnipresent activity. You know, Facebook didn't. You couldn't like anything. You know, you couldn't like look at a picture and like it or automatically share it to Facebook without opening the Facebook app um, until iOS six, which none of us have yet, because Apple has an iron fist on on all sorts of on all that. That third-party, you know, we, we we coined it as third-party multitasking, and 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 third-party multitasking really isn't doesn't exist on the iPhone to this day. There are certain tasks that um, essentially Apple takes over, um, like playing music for uh, Pandora um, in the background that they allow, or allowing you to tweet a status and, and a picture directly from your iPhone, stuff like that. But, you know, there's there's still most of the apps, you know, require to do anything cool, requires you to actually open up the iPhone and open up the app and do something. Um, but I like that idea. I like the idea in general that that should be what the design um, is, is that, you know, you load it on and... 
you it yeah it runs in the background because I mean that was the beauty of that's mm-hmm. the beauty of a lot of what the smartphones today do you know especially the native applications you know it'd be like saying it, it'd be like let's say you have a phone app and the phone app has to be open in order to receive calls that would be a useless app <laughs> um, but but it runs in the background you know and it's it's the and today the phone apps are really irreducible especially when you get into stuff like Siri and and Google's equivalent where you can just you know from one tech from one command center you can tell it to make a phone call to whomever and or send a text you know and you those are truly irreducible apps but they tend to be native apps so that would be the biggest struggle like I, th- I, I think um, and it's funny you know like those would be the you know the question that I would I would have and, and although that's I like where he's going with this mentality is think about what you do on your computer how many irreducible apps do you load onto your computer to do background stuff for you and have them working constantly um, that aren't native to the operating system, aren't Microsoft utilities or uh, OS X utilities? And I don't, I don't, I have a few utilities that that I, mm. I have that run. I have like a CPU monitor that runs on my desktop, um, and, you know, and and but but other than that. I don't have very many utilities that I that I keep churning constantly in the background, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with just performance. I've got a I've got a pretty good computer, but if you you got too many utilities going at the same time, it, it's going to lag on everything. Um, mm, and, yeah, you know, and so I don't know. It's a it's an interesting it's an, it's a good. I think what it, one of the things that I like about that mentality is it's like Facebook. You know, we've we've talked about Facebook's mobile strategy before, and and I'm a big believer that what they basically need to do is there needs to be a timeline app, there needs to be a homepage app, there needs to be a um, photos app and a chat app, and they're working and, on and, it. You know, <laughs> and, yeah, and you'll have like man, maybe one main app if you're not like me, but I think that each one of those should be each major function that Facebook's had that Facebook has should be reduced down to just that function and that's it. Um, and, and I think you know it's better as a company to have a suite of apps that takes care of a suite of different uh, different options than one major app that does a thousand different things um, and is slow and could easily be reduced. Um, it's a good mentality. I, I like that mentality. Um, and, you know, it's re- it's it's reduce it down to its basic thing that it does. And not one step further. Um, that would be the biggest concern, I think, with you know taking it mm. too far. Is you know, is what happens if I don't want you to tweet where I am all the time? You know, it's that's you know, I yeah, you know, just my personal use. I think you know. Yeah, that's tricky. But uh, you know, but maybe and and so it's 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 and I think well, that's one of the beautiful beauties of what you know, Twitter. I think is a great example of that. It, the Twitter app is so simple. It basically it tweets. And it's got the the tweet tweet stream, and it's like integrated into your phone. That is a great example of you know posting your status and updating. And part of that has to do with the nature of Twitter and what it is, because the app pretty much encom- encompasses everything. <laughs> you know that's but, that's funny. I actually I almost put an article on here, and I didn't. That was talking about Twitter and how they were r- making a big risk by adding too many features to their system. Yeah. So, yeah. it, you know, so that you couldn't just do the text message thing anymore, um, and how they were unreducing it, and you know, in an effort to quote add value, and yeah. it was like, no, you guys already have a ton of value, and all you're gonna do is tick people off and make it so that you can't extend it, and that's gonna you know crumble everything. But right. I didn't. Add it, so, but that's uh, that's fascinating that you brought that up. Yeah, that's that's interesting that people are talking about that too. It's a big big risk, you know. I'm, Facebook now will actually read the uh, shortened text links from Twitter and will link it into my status. So that that reducibility is getting even better. You know, I I I like it. I like it for what it is, and you know, mm-hmm. I think that you know. Yeah. Speaking of Facebook, um, I read another TechCrunch article actually. And I thought this one was really good. It was called um, How Facebook Could Save Its Shattered Share Price. I don't know how much you've been following uh, the Facebook. Ooh, yes, I've been um, following this one for a while. Their IPO was at 38 bucks, and yes. um, they're a little bit below 20 now. 
And if we recall, what did I say? I said don't buy until it bottoms out, even before the shares went on. But once it bottoms out, buy. Yeah. So are, are, have you bought yet? Is it bottomed out? No, it's not bottomed out. But uh -oh, but, but but I haven't changed my uh, my opinion on that. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so I just don't have the money. I'm paying off student loans. Lucky yeah. Me. Um, <laughs> so this guy he gives a bunch of uh, basically ways for Facebook to make money. <laughs> Which, I mean, that's what it's about, right? When it comes to a share price. Uh, right. At the end of the day. Um, and I thought these were really cool ideas, and I just wanted to share them and kind of get your feedback. Um, the first one, which I honestly, I think that this is one that um, is the future, or at least a ton of people are pinning their hopes on this one. And it's sponsored stories. The basic idea is if you're, say, like, your Twitter or your Google Plus or your NBC, you know, whatever. Uh, if you have like user a place where users generate content, okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, you have an opportunity to insert sponsored stories. This idea of um, you know their their stories. It's the same type of content. The difference is it's paid for for placement. Uh, we saw this on Dig um, when. It was Dig 3, <laughs> version 3, or whatever version yeah. they're on now. Um, you know, way back before the change and when they were successful and before now. Um, and, and so I, you know, so that's their whole thing is like, just do more of that. Um, it's kind of, I mean, that's all basically search results are, right? They're sponsored search results. Um, yeah, and, you know, the nice part about it is, is if Facebook's paying attention to the kind of stories you click on, um, whether it be through your friends or stuff, the chances that they're going to pop a sponsored ad that I'm actually interested in, or sponsored story rather, goes up a lot. You know that that which is yeah. all right. That's kind of my my thing with advertising is I don't want dumb advertising. I want advertising that matters <laughs> to me. You know. Yeah, and I mean, and they say you know here they need to watch their click through rates and um, but he's like they need to increase it by at least three times. Hmm. Which I'm like, wow, that's pretty big. But yeah, totally. If you're like, oh, I always tend to click on Apple and Google stories. If Apple and Google have a sponsored ad, for, ad you know, story or something. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, I guess more, I'm sure. That's a trick too, right? Is like having a good sponsored story. Right. If CNET makes and writes an article on Google, that's the sort of thing. And then CNET sponsoring that ad, it'll pop on my, on yeah. my timeline. Yeah. And then they get their ad dollars or whatever they get. Uh, another one which I thought was interesting, off-site ad network. Um, and this was one of the things that made Google pretty huge back in the day. Um, and Facebook should do the same thing. You know, they've got a ton of information on users, and they should be able to crawl. And, you know, with Google, their whole thing was like, we'll crawl the content on your site, and we'll make these ads we embed on your site relevant to whatever the content is, right? <laughs> that was their whole thing. Facebook can go, we know who it is who's visiting, we'll make the, you know, instead of showing ads on Facebook, we'll show it here, and we can try to curtail it to whatever the content is on your site as well. Um, we know that they like Coke, we know that they don't like Pepsi, therefore we will show them a Coke ad whenever they're reading a story about how you should drink more water. Fries. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, exactly, and I actually think that's huge, that's huge right there. Yeah. Uh, because it also has the credibility piece of it. Oh, I'll click on this ad. I know it's safe because it's served up by Facebook. As right. Opposed to some other shady something. Another mm. one. Um, another one is a want button. So the idea is if you're an e-commerce site, like say you're selling whimsical funny t-shirts, you could not just have a like button, but you could also have a want button and an own button. Oh, I want this. I heart it. I coveted something like that, um, and I you can imagine it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the right spin on these things. I get it. Yeah, and um, you know, and the idea there is once again, people are explicitly saying, "Oh, I really want this." Well, I, and that's one where they got to be careful, right? Because the second you hit a want button, whoa! All of a sudden, I'm getting all ads for this. Weird. Yeah. Um, so. 
Yeah, you know, I already I want it for these book. You don't need to mention it again. <laughs> yeah, thanks for reminding me I don't own this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another one, uh, mobile app ads. In the sense that they're ads for mobile apps, so when you go to, because, you know, their big whole thing right now is people are increasingly going mobile, and the ad revenue is not nearly as good, so therefore... Not nearly, uh, it's non-existent. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, well, and, and what they might be able to do is, instead of doing traditional ads, um, promote mobile apps that when people click it, they'll download the app. And right. so, so one of the things that I find interesting on that one, because... This is so clearly this is such so clearly a Facebook strategy early on. Even if you hadn't watched the movie yet, it was pretty clear that that Facebook was very resistant to ad revenue early on. Yeah. But in the beginning, because they wanted to quote unquote keep it cool, um, and that's exactly what they're doing in the uh, with the mobile space right now. They want to become the they don't want Google Plus to get a foothold in mobile because well Google Plus Plus does it without uh, ads you know they don't want any they don't want to give anybody a reason to use anything but mobile Facebook so they're having huge numbers and I keep hearing like on the new on like on the radio and TV people talking about how well obviously the reason why they're not making any revenue is because ads on their mobile site just aren't happening for whatever reason you know like the for whatever reason is Apple's decided or, geez, Facebook has decided to not turn them on yet. The question that I, that that you know we all have to ask is why and what are they waiting for? What's that? What's that special moment where they think, okay, we have enough of a, a foothold, we can now start adding ads slowly mm -hmm. and you know really um, you know and make a ton of money because it's, it, clearly that's that's all it's going to take. Um, uh, and and I've never seen ads on Facebook. That's because I've been using AdBlock since before Facebook added ads. <laughs> so um, I I don't know what everybody's complaining about, but um, <laughs> but yeah. I've uh, you know it, that's my thought. That's my big question is you know, well, yeah, honestly, you've got all of these are getting away from those types of ads. Right, and that's what's clever about these, you know, definitely. But I think. You know, just the Facebook stock in general will be uh, much favored by the addition of uh, mobile ads. Because I don't think you don't um, even with AdBlock, it doesn't block um, AdWords or well, maybe it does that. But you know, the, the Google ads on search results, does it block those? Mm. I don't think so. Because mm. I have AdBlock and I think I see them. I see the sponsored ads. I see some sponsored ads. That's the same um, thing. Okay. Well, it's it's the. What's interesting is, uh, wow, I don't see any right now. I wonder if. Uh, it depends on the search. <laughs> well, I just did Home Depot. <laughs> um, let's do Maybe Home like Repair. Fence project. Yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah, Home Repair. That one should. Nothing. What the heck? Am I just? Okay. No, they do. They do have. There's. Oh, okay. They don't. They don't. They don't highlight them anymore as sponsored ads. But those are clearly three sponsored ads. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah. So I'm getting them. I know that okay. Dig and Reddit, both of their sponsored stories, all their sponsored stories, are labeled as sponsored stories. So Ad AdBlock removes them. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which I appreciate. Um, but. Uh, um, another one is called Facebook Exchange, which is a little shady in my opinion. Yeah. Um, basically, as you visit websites, they're collecting information on where it is that you're going. And so it's not just your activity on Facebook anymore. So as they create, uh, you know, it basically it's pretty much a database of your um, musings, they can deliver you more targeted ads. Um, you know, the idea being, oh, look at this. This person went to a couple different travel sites recently. Let's send them a travel ad. And you're like, wow, I never mentioned anything about traveling on Facebook, but now you get an ad. It's because they know that you're planning for a travel trip. Huh. I've had this funny feeling that if Google did that, they would get in a massive amount of trouble. Yeah. But I don't you know, know why they're not. Yeah, and it's what it's weird because it's like I guess for me, I always just assumed that was the case, especially where anything where if for any website where your login credentials are Facebook because they exchange information, you know. You okay, get, well that's fair. 
you know, Yelp gets your information and there I there was a big case recently about their super cookies that could track all of your roamings around the internet, whether it was part of Facebook's network or not. Um, and which is pretty shady <laughs> and, and I believe they got in trouble for. It. Uh but um but you know but Facebook has huge influence outside of to that, you know, Facebook dot com and so they you know, I'm I'm sure that they're they are collecting all sorts of information like that. I'd be, I would actually be surprised if that's not already part of their algorithm for serving you ads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another two more um, ads targeted by what people are mentioning. Makes so sense. similar to the sponsored results ads is kind of how I understand them. Um, but the idea being that they're tied to, like, somebody mentions the fact, oh, I just went to Starbucks and had a tasty latte. Oh, look at that. Right underneath, there's a advertisement for Starbucks lattes. Yeah. You know, things like that. So it's not, it's not a sponsored story. It's an, there's literally, it's a combination of, it gives you a story and then the ad right underneath it. Yeah. Um, which you'll never see, but... Um, <laughs> the, the idea being trying to make them more curtailed um, more targeted so that when you see it, you're like, okay, I'm genuinely interested. That's basically what this, you know, the entire advice is. And the last one is, which is genuinely different, um, is social commerce. Uh, you know, being able to purchase those fun virtual goods. Basically, Facebook says, hey, it's this person's birthday. Want to send them a f special little something? Yeah, um, and have that special something literally be like maybe a gift card. Or a cheap gift, like physical, tangible goods. Yeah, not like those like Facebook gifts back in the day. Yeah, yeah, That's no, don't. Book. You're not you're like gonna put a sheep on their wall or something. It's uh, literally send them an Amazon gift card. Or yeah, that's like cool. That. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. So you tag that up with, hey, happy birthday. Hey, want to add a gift card to it? That would be that actually be pretty cool. Um, especially wow. if they post that on that on, would like, be the wall. But that would be I actually really awesome. Give this because then what they can do is they can say, yeah, pick the company that you want to give them a gift card to, and then at the end of the day, at the end of your birthday, you would just have like all of these gift cards that you could redeem. Wow, that's actually a really good idea. I like I that it, a lot. Well, it's and I think that they could if they could work with company. Let's go with Amazon, right? Yeah. Because um, I think it'd be too little, too self-serving to give away Facebook credits. Um, but let's say you go with Amazon, uh, right. and you literally you go and you got your card with Facebook and and it's already on file, and you just go give them a dollar. I mean, it's just right. literally a no-brainer. You go, yeah, happy birthday. Here's a buck, and you got 50 friends who will give you a buck, and you're like, woohoo! I just got a $50 Amazon gift card. I really think they should take care of this in the next 13 days, 12, just, uh. to, <laughs> just to be sure. I would be, I'd really appreciate that Facebook. And this is a genius idea. Um, it's worth like, ah, that's a good idea. That is actually a really clever way to do that. You know, and then they just take a small cut. You know, take whatever percentage. Yeah. Yeah, and and you could you imagine like, okay, maybe, um, you know, you as your birthday, you you get to select, right? Um, I prefer iTunes gift cards or something, and you know, and so whenever they do it, they go give this person. I don't know, you, or you just give them a credit and then it decides at the end. I don't know, but then it would also be cool like at the end when the person redeems it, everyone else gets a direct message, hey, thanks for this. And you get Right, that'd be really cool. Yeah, I know. So honestly, that's the one where I look at that and go, oh my gosh, that could just be a huge, huge moneymaker uh, for Facebook. And um, yeah, man. people would love to do it. And there is definitely like one or two people that I would give gifts to on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would it would be really interesting because it's like if you get invited to a birthday party, um, you're expected to bring a gift. Now it's kind of, could you imagine it gets to the point where like if you say happy birthday on someone's wall, you're expected to like leave a buck. That would be yeah. that would be interesting to see what well, kind of social. What would, be, what would be really awesome is if it if it doesn't it says happy birthday Matthew and the quantity in the store. <laughs> yes. Like Unbelievable social pressure of oh this guy really likes Matthew. Oh this person hates Matthew. They didn't give it any money. <laughs> oh man. That would be awesome. Uh, that would. That would be great. 
So anyways, I think, I, okay, so let's, um, there's a bunch of ideas. Let's take a few steps back, you know. Okay. Clearly, Facebook needs to figure out more ways to make revenue. That's no surprise. We've all known that. It sounds like they've got a, they, they have a good business, um, and now it's a matter of transitioning to mobile and making that happen, and we'll talk about Zynga later. Um, but that obviously is not a super sustainable option right. <laughs> right now, and so they need to diversify fast. And I don't know if they're going to find that, you know, that killer golden bullet thing where they just rake in billions and billions of dollars. I think it is going to have to be some sort of combination of all these things where, you know what, we know what people want, we know where they're visiting, and we can give them stories uh, you know, sponsored stories, regular ads, both on Facebook, off of Facebook, on mobile, for mobile. Uh, we can tie it with what people are saying, with what they're saying, and um, you know. And and when you start to do all that, you're like, wow, we, we, yeah, we've got these seven different revenue streams that all add up to something significant. Right. Which I think most companies are like that, right? HP doesn't pin it all on a single laptop. <laughs> Yeah. You know, they they go, well, we know that people like laptops, and we know they like desktops, we know they like printers, we know they like servers. Let's do a little bit of it all, and together we'll make some money that way. Right. And they need to do the same thing, which is the scary stuff about, like, Google, right? If, for whatever reason, suddenly, magically, and I don't think it'll ever happen, uh, you know, their AdWords doesn't work anymore, I, they're in trouble. <laughs> right. So one of the things, one of my, you know, yeah, I, I think that's a good plan. Um, and uh, so I, another thing that they need to work on, if you don't mind me including this now, um, is the fact that it's not just the, that they need to get users interested in clicking on ads and going to ads, which is what that article is entirely about. It's about how do oh, you yeah. generate user interest? How do you actually get people to click on ads more frequently? In, in Facebook. Um, but they also need to convince people who are spending, there's two sides to it. Number one, they need to make sure that people are clicking and you know that way when you spend your money you feel like oh this is definitely going to get people to come here. So instead of spending a thousand dollars on on Google Ads and or you know AdSense, Word Ads, whatever, and spending only $100 on Facebook because you know you're going to get a certain amount of uh, money from, from Google, you know that's going to work, uh, you, gotta, you also have to uh, convince them that the clicks that they're getting and the clicks through that they're having are legitimate. Um, there's been this huge issue that, that kind of surfaced this week that's really been beating down their, uh, their, their stock in the last week. Uh, which basically people coming out and saying so almost nine percent, eight point seven percent of their nine hundred and fifty five million active users. So of their nearly billion active users, eighty three million of them are uh, are fake profiles as they call them, mm -hmm. um, and they uh, and this is their own estimate. So it, that's probably a uh, conservative estimate, um, and what they're saying is that of those 83 million, nearly half of them are like pets and um, and uh, workplaces and stuff that, you know, really should have like a fan page, um, but don't, then a certain percentage of them are uh, duplicate accounts that uh, a member no longer uses because I already have a, another one. Um, but there's, there's left with about 15 million or so bots. Uh, people, you know, somebody has created a script that will run a Facebook page that essentially goes around liking things. Nice. Um, and one and one of the ways that you can that Facebook makes money is by sponsoring pages to like. You know, your company, somebody somebody likes your tech company that sells cameras. Somebody likes a bunch of tech cam companies, and so your page gets pu pushed up to them and said, hey, maybe you should like this one, too. They make cool cameras, and so you like them. Well, you pay for that kind of placement as a business, right. um, and basically what they're saying is that companies have been getting tons and tons of likes, and it's all fraudulent. There are these bots, um, and, and one of the ways that one of the companies that first pointed it out, they basically said, like, we have a really good, we know what our return is. 
this is how much we pay, um, this is how many clicks we get, and this is the click through that we get to it, and this is how much money we make based on those click throughs. There's like a, you know, they, they are able to pretty concisely say, we pay this much, we make this much off of it. And what they're finding is like with with Facebook is that that, that equation is laughably untrue, um, which to them suggested that there was something wrong. You know, they were getting tons and tons of likes, but nobody was actually liking, nobody was actually being motivated to use the page base, you know, use the product based on that, or clicking on advertising, or going to the legitimate company. Um, and this calls, this harkens back to the idea of people, you know, of of people saying, you know, companies not investing in Facebook because it doesn't generate, you know, Facebook. They, you know, they've always been complaining. You can't generate likes, and if you can, it doesn't really seem to do anything for your business. And the co comment there, the the truth that seems to be leaking out is that. Uh, it's because it seems like it's probably a lot of it is fake, hmm. um, and uh, you know this guy he he wrote his thing saying basically yeah you know when I realized that there was a problem I started looking at the users who were liking us and they're these these profile pages that have nothing on them except for 700 likes and they're liking Whoa. stuff every 30 they're liking different things every 30 seconds um, and the big question is uh, who are these you know who's doing this. Um, so this is like a legitimate issue, and you know, obviously Facebook has something to make off of this by by having a ton, tons and tons of likes. But that's like so hugely fraudulent that it's hard to believe that Facebook would be actively participating in in something like that. Um, and the other thing is that it's 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 not very impressively done in that it's a bunch of fake pages. You would think as Facebook, if they were going to decide to create fake users, that they've got so many people. Like, let's say they needed, oh, we only need 15 million users to really boost our likes. We've got 955. Let's make composite people. Let's search pictures where it's four different people, but they all have similar pay pictures. And like, let's populate these pages with pictures and information about who they are. And like, let's build composite people so it'd be very difficult to track down where these things are coming from, hmm. and then use them to like it and have them be active users. It really feels like this is a bot that logs in, creates a person, and then um, uh, goes and like stuff around the internet, um, and and you know, I, I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting issue that's that's a, a, a arisen, um, and it's really calling into the credit calling into question the credibility of Facebook. You know, who, who's doing this? Why are they doing it? Why aren't you battling against it? Why are you charging me for fraudulent likes? I'm paying good money for this, and all I'm getting are is fake activity. Sure, my like count goes up, but that doesn't turn into actual revenue, um, and because real people aren't liking me. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. It's a it's an interesting problem that they're in the middle of. You know, like you said, I still think fundamentally they're a technology company. They've got really good technology. They're more than just a social network, and their social network is the best in the world. Um, you know, it's first in class by anybody's definition, um, and that doesn't seem to be like they're really going to slow down from that. Um, and on top of it, they're becoming, you know, a fundamental building block of a lot of websites. They got tons and tons of information. They're not. I really don't think, you know, you, you people keep saying they're circling around the drain, which is just. You know, basically, obviously, what happened was they set their their price per share way too high, um, and then they got hit with a little bit of bad news, and then a narrative starts to build that this is a company built on cars, a house of cards, and so now people are you know taking it down. They're making good money off of shorting the company, um, you know, but but fundamentally, it's still a good company. It's not like it's not like Facebook is needs to to go anywhere. But but then you get stuff like this, and you're like, oh man, that's something you got to take care of. And who's doing this? To to what end? Who's making money off of this? Hmm, is this yeah. a you know? That's my big question. Is are we gonna find out in a couple of months that Facebook paid some Russian hackers to build fake bots to you know to 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 participate in fraud? I mean, that would be 
huge. That would be such a big deal if that had happened. Um, and you know, nobody seems to be accusing Facebook of that yet, except in a you know a very you know no one's outwardly saying this is Facebook doing Facebook's doing, but you know follow the dollar. Who who would do this and to what ends? You know what's their goal here? Oh. People who build these sorts of networks don't, you know, they don't tend to, their goal is not usually to help make Facebook money, you know? <laughs> it's usually to mess with Facebook. Um, yeah. And it seems like a really complicated plan to, we're going to make it look like Facebook is involved in fraud while making them tons of money. Um, and hopefully at some point someone will figure it out and then they'll get in, you know, they'll get in trouble unless they can prove it wasn't them. Um which seems like it would be pretty easy to do. I don't know. It's a it's a complicated issue. Really, really fascinating what's going over on, on going on over at Facebook right now. You know. But yeah, I um, I don't know. It is that is tough. Yeah, they'll figure it out. They'll be fine. Besides, it's only fifteen million. Mm -hmm. Percentage wise. That's reasonable. One and a half percent. I'll bet it's a lot more than that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll bet when all is said and done, they're going to find out that, you know, there may be 87. They may have been honest about the number of uh, fake profile pages when it comes to duplicates and, um, you know, and pet pages and whatnot. I want to know how but, you know that stuff. Yeah. I, well, I do know how. Because they got some database guy and they said run a query on these results and that's how they came up with their estimates. Yeah, I wonder why so they don't... Because they, like, they don't look at the profiles. Oh, well, they might have looked at, you know, 10 or 20 of them just to make sure that their query was a good one. But that's yeah. it. And, then they, and when it turned up that, you know, there's 100 million, you know, bots out there, they said, how about we tighten the parameters a little bit? <laughs> Of our yeah, query, right. you know, and and that's, I mean, it it'll yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting as as this gets further and further shaken out. You know, wouldn't be an issue if if they were generating ad revenue and people were pleased with the results, but they're not. So now everybody wants to know: is there any fraud going on? Mm -hmm. uh, Makes well, sense. Yeah. So. Let's talk about the iPhone for a bit. All right, cool. So this week has been kind of a big week. Uh, Samsung iPhone testimony going on and yeah, trying to figure out deals. it. Yeah, and it was one of those things where it's like I, it's not, it's the lawsuit's not interesting yet. We're not, it's not going to be interesting until you get to the final say on who's right, who's wrong. I think there's a lot of speculation about what will happen, but it's not really worth bringing up. But that being said. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah, like you said, a lot of re revelations coming out of it because they're interviewing all these, like, you know, really, really big wigs at Am Apple. They're getting all sorts of documentation out. And so we're learning some stuff about the creation of the iPhone and the inner workings of Apple that we didn't know before. Um, so, and, and here's, a, here's a list of some interesting facts that we learned this week. Uh, first, before deciding to build the iPhone and iPad, Apple considered other product categories, including crazy stuff like cars or cameras. Um, that's according to uh, the dude who builds the Macs. Um, he's a smart guy, Scott. Um, hey, not not Scott Forstall, uh, but he uh, he basically was saying, yeah, I mean, like we had been hugely successful with the iPod. We were trying to figure out, well, what do we want to do next? Do more than the computers. Um mm. and 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 actually at the time they were already working on you know multi-touch screens which would eventually become the iPad when they started to you know just throw out crazy stuff you know what can we do what what would be awesome um and what could we make that would be insanely great and they they you know they they bounced around you know classic brainstorming session they they bounced around crazy ideas until they finally settled on something that actually made sense. Uh, which was a phone. Um, the uh, the iPhone was codenamed Project Purple, which uh, I was like, what? They didn't really get into why they called it purple, but the reason where the project isn't came that a from, reference to a that's isn't that a Beatles thing or something or maybe the project part comes from Project Mayhem, 
which is uh, for anybody who's seen Fight Club, Fight Club, once they move outside of the basements and they actually become a big organized group, it's called Project Mayhem. And the reason why we know this is because uh, when they uh, once they actually once the team was all assembled, they went and they took over a building in Cupertino and they hung up a big fo poster outside. It was a big Fight Club poster. Um, and it was, you know, as in, you know, first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. And, <laughs> um, and just a sort of a continual reminder of the first ru rule of Project Purple is you don't talk about Project Purple. So right. you know, very much trying to keep everything secret. Um, when Scott Forstall started to put the uh, iOS software team together, the guys that were actually going to become, um, uh, he become the iPhone team, uh, Steve Jobs basically said, you can't use anybody unless they're already inside of Apple. Um, wow. You know, people we trust, people we know we can trust. Makes um, sense. Yeah, and so they, and, and when and they were saying that when, when Scott brought them into the office, he would sit them down and be like, hey, we want to bring you to, we want to talk about bringing you into another project. And they'd be like, okay, cool. And he goes, but I can't tell you what the project is. Okay. He goes, and I can't offer you pretty much anything other than the knowledge that for the next two or three years, there's going to be really, really long nights, long hours, give up your evenings and weekends. Um, and you can't tell any of your friends what you're doing. Yeah, and it's going to be super... Very Ocean's Eleven-ish. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be, yeah, yeah. Are you in or are you out right now? Yeah, pretty much. And and he said, you know, he goes, you're going to have a... He goes, don't worry, you're going to have a success. You go and do something else, you stay on something else in Apple, and you're going to be successful. Um, you know, Apple's a great company. I just think that you'd be great for what we're doing here, and I wanted to invite you to be part of it. Which, honestly, if somebody who has the ear of Steve Jobs walks up to me and says, "Look, I want you to partake in a secret project that uh, you want to be pretty cool, but don't worry, you do something that's already been done before, uh, you'll probably be successful." I'm not going to believe them, <laughs> which clearly enough people understood what he was saying, which is. We're doing something completely awesome and new and incredible, and we don't want anybody to know about this at all. Like, it's one of those, like, it was so understated that you can tell what people got excited about it. You know, it's like he's trying wow. to convince you to not do it. But the very fact that he's asking you to do it is like, that's, you know, oh, man, they, they're, they're such showmen. It's not even funny. You know, even to people within their company, they're showmen. You could be like, oh, man, I would not be able to, I would like, I would go home and, you know, probably not tell anybody because you'd feel like you'd just given the, the codes to the nuclear, uh, you know, armament of America because he's like, oh, my gosh. But, like, you know, you, you'd tell your significant other and you'd be like, this is crazy. I don't know what this is, but obviously it's going to be incredibly awesome because nobody will tell me what it is, <laughs> which is goofy, but... You know, pretty brilliant. Um, so here's what I want to know. What? Is there currently a place like that in Apple right now? Yeah. Oh, clearly. Is there? I don't the know. Team that, the team that's working on the future of the Apple TV and the iPad Mini. Have, what do you know about the iPad Mini, other than its size? That its chances are good, that it's going to happen? My point exactly. Um, what do you know about the Apple TV? Well, yeah, no, no, no. But what I'm saying basically is like with this one, clearly there was a poster and a floor where they were like, don't go in here. Yeah, um, is there a secret place in similar to that? I'm sure, you know, I've, I've, I haven't. We been don't know. To, is that, okay. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, we don't know. I'm, but, you know, I've, I don't have any, one, what, let me say this. I know a couple of Apple employees who work on the main campus and, they are unaware of that stuff when it's going on. I mean, like, it seems in retrospect, obviously, they put a big old Fight Club poster up, you know, it just seems like, it seems painfully obvious in retrospect, but for whatever yeah, reason, I'd be like at lunch, nobody right? noticed. You see that new Fight Club poster that says, right. you know, Project Purple, which means we shouldn't talk about it? Oh, yeah. What do you think it is? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's, but it's like, it's painfully obvious that, but yet it seems like nobody was talking about it. Like, uh, you know, and I don't think it was just they were obeying the don't talk about it stuff. I think it was, they didn't, they, it was actually just subdued enough where it wasn't obvious. 
Um, <clears throat> what was he going to say? Uh, there's another another one that they came out with was even as the iPhone's popularity has soared, Apple has continued to lavish more millions on campaigns and advertising the device. It spent 97 and a half million dollars in 2008 on the iPhone on iPhone ads in the U.S. and 149.6 wow. million in 2009, 137 in 2010. It spent almost that much, 149 um, million on the iPad ads in 2010. So there's a tons and ton, tons and tons of money going into the iPhone um, advertising, and uh, not as much as uh, Microsoft spends on theirs that doesn't sell. Uh, a small fraction as uh, many, but they're still, despite its popularity and despite the word of mouth, they're still hitting the advertising campaigns pretty hard. Um, and then also, uh, uh, because it... Um, we don't spend nearly that much on our podcast. No. No, we don't. Not close. Apple um, spent about $149.5 million more than we did for the iPad. Somewhere somewhere in that uh, ballpark, yes. hundred. Yeah. 149.5 since they spent yeah. 149.5, um, and then also uh, it's, which I don't know why this I don't know why this seems surprising to anybody because anybody who's ever seen somebody with an iPhone has seen somebody with an iPhone case. It's 70 percent of uh, percent of people who buy an iPhone buy them or buy a case to go with them, which like I was actually surprised it was that low. I didn't realize that one out of almost one out of every four people that I see with an iPhone has it uncovered. I would have sworn it was even higher than that. I um, did not have a case, and then I dropped it one day on this corner yes. and shipped it. And then after I finished crying, I decided that it was time to get a case. And so I got a cheapy plastic one, and it's been good. I don't do the whole like uh, screen cover thing though. That's dumb. Yeah. I just want to. If I literally could like figure out a way to put some sort of protective thing on the corners, and that yeah. was it. That is all I would have. You gotta get one of their bumpers. That no, costs no, no, like just seventeen. The, see, just the corners. That's oh, okay. Why. You don't want to spend seventy dollars on a ten cent piece of plastic from Apple. No, not really. <laughs> But, yeah. So no, I so I protect mine, which I think is technically it's the plastic part. I don't think that's the glass part that chipped, but hmm. maybe it's the glass part. I don't know. Interesting. Who wouldn't get a case? I mean, come on, really. That's what I. That's what I'm thinking. So, but that's uh, those are some interesting. Unless insights, they though. literally they figure out how to build in like soft plastic, so it, you know, a bumper case built into it, that'd be cool. Yeah, which they won't do with the next one. Don't get your hopes up. I don't, I'm not buying the next one, so they got a couple more to figure it out. <laughs> cool. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of cool that they're revealing all this stuff. I, I read somewhere real quick, they were like, you know, the cost of this case is confidentiality or, you know, really bringing a bunch of things to light that we didn't know before, which they're just interesting to know, right? That it's not like competitive. Right. Stuff maybe maybe not I don't know. Um, so good for Apple. Let's move it back to Facebook land and um, Zynga. Cool. Um, for whatever reason, I was on TechCrunch a lot this week because I have another one of theirs. Um, <laughs> they just they were doing good writing, I guess. Uh, this one's called the Zynga Apocalypse, um, and pretty much what comes back. Uh, what com what did I say? What comes next? Um, that's what I meant to say. Are you gonna say that? What? <laughs> what? I don't. Well, I don't know where I came up with comes back. Um, so basically, this guy's sitting there. You know, once again, here we have another stock that is down to like three dollars. <laughs> right. Um, not doing awesome. And this one guy, he wrote an article that was called Zenga and the Beginning of the End. And um, he said essentially the main problem in social games is that the product is almost identical across all providers and that social game makers had trapped themselves into thinking that it had to be so. Um, his whole thing is like, 
Um, and like I've played, a, I play a couple social games because um, I'm that guy. And um, basically, it's like they're all the same, and they're all kind of lame. And you know, if you've played, I, you know, and he's right. Farmville feels the same as Cityville, feels the same as Millionaire City, feels the same as a whole bunch of stuff. And even if you play, um, there was a zombie version of it. You okay over there, dude? Yeah. Okay. Paying uh, attention. <laughs> which is like all of a sudden you're like moving around, doing stuff. Anyways, um, you know, even I, I play this one zombie game, and it feels almost exactly... It feels very similar to uh, like the Sim City game that I'm playing right now, in the sense that you know they they limit what you can do. There's that they call it like social pacing. Apparently, I learned that. Um, and That's not an you know, there's just <laughs> well, yeah. Well, basically, what it means is that we're not just gonna let you play as long as you want. We're going to well, try to pace it out for you. You, you know the reason. No thanks. You know the reason why that is is, is really annoying to me is I feel like it's because what they've what they've discovered and this is just going to be my hypothesis. What they've discovered is there's not really that much game to play. Um, they're they're not very big games. They're not very creative. They don't have a lot to do. So if you don't yeah. pace people, they're going to discover too much, they're going to do too much, and they're going to be bored in an afternoon. So instead of building bigger and better yeah, games... Oh, I just did the same thing for three right, hours. Instead of, so instead of building bigger and better games, they're going to try to pace you so you can't do it all in one afternoon, which is obnoxious. That's like the worst way to design a game, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, no, totally, exactly. Um and then the other thing that he says is that their basic strategy for keeping the revenues coming in, because eventually people figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah. No matter how you pace it, they're like, okay, I'm bored of this. Uh, basically what they'll do is they will create, um, it'll be the same framework, and then they'll just give you a different setting for it. Oh, now it's um, Spaceville, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, now you're building right. cities in space. woo -hoo. Uh, or the other thing that they do is they will um, they'll pay a bunch of money to add new music, new users like when Zengabot draw something. Basically, they were buying a whole bunch of new users that they could then try to hook into Farmville and such. Uh, mm. You know, is the idea and cross pollinate back and forth. You know, that's so so. There's that kind of thing. So he's pretty much like, yes, it was a good start. That was Web 1.0 um, when we have the animated gifs. And um, and it has its time and its place, and he's like, basically, people are getting sick of it, and it's time to move on to social games 2.0 or generation two, as he calls it, and it won't stay that way because that's not a cool name. But um, but yeah, but games 2.0, and uh, and his whole thing is like, what they really have to what they have to define or answers the questions they have to answer are where is the real value. How do we deepen that value? And then what is the most immediate way to deliver that value? Okay. Mm. So, you know, so the real question, you know, so the first one, right? Where is that value? Um, what's the purpose of social games? What do they get out of it? Um, what do what does someone like me consider valuable? And, you know, he's like, here's one, he goes, here's some hints, some helpers. Um, forget about the multiplayer future, and this is so true. Um, they have found out that um, players actually, like myself, play all by themselves. They don't like talk to other people. And um, of course, anybody who's ever played video games ever <laughs> know that. <laughs> you might play with three or four of your friends if the computer's not good enough, but. Especially like, especially new players, they play by themselves, which most people who are playing those kinds of games are new to gaming. You know, they're not obsessive people who can beat the computer um, the first time that they play through a game. Mm hmm No, no, totally. And um, and so he's like, so that's not, you know, when we say social, that is not the value of it. Um, he's also saying it's not about status. Uh, this idea that like you can buy cool hats. Or you know, decorate your home or something. That, like that is that is clearly not entirely true, but I see. But I well, yeah, that's not that. As a general, if, if okay. you have a if you have a if you have a great game, that is a great way to monetize it 
um, after you have a good game. But without a good game, that's the okay. worst way to make totally it. Totally got it. Um, and he goes, now, buying things for, like, utility purposes, he goes, that's a little different. Um, but, you know, just for the decoration stuff, not necessarily. Um, another thing he talks about is, like, living a life. Um, it's dumb. Uh, he's basically saying, you know, you try to... Your life is boring, so therefore you're going online to spice it up. Um, and he's just like, people don't do very well at that. Um, and so he sits there and says, okay, so what's the real value? Um, they're single... So what he's saying is that Generation 1 games, they are single-player games, which are free-to-play, and occasionally tax users into communicating or spending to be allowed to keep playing. <laughs> Right, which I was like, yeah. dude, that's a great sentence right there. <laughs> that's yeah. totally what it is. Um, he says the the other real value is advancement, or he goes, that's one of them. Um, and then there is social contact in the in the context of games that that is valuable, um, especially if it helps them win. And then. Um, and then he says that players um, overwhelmingly prefer to play their games on their timetable for their fun. And, and that's why he's saying the whole, uh, you know, the idea of, like, you need to be able to drop out when you want to or, you know, join up when you need to and the whole pacing thing doesn't work because it's not on your time anymore. Um, right. He goes, two examples are um, Journey and um, Realm of the Mad God, apparently, are good yeah. ones. Then he goes on and he says, okay, that's what the value is. How do you deepen that value? And, and I thought what was interesting about this was he goes, if you were able to um, free yourself of all the trappings and understand the true value of social games, what could you build? How could you make it deeper before getting too scared off by the fear of not being liked by everybody else? Um, what? I have no idea what I'm talking about here. Um, his whole thing, I know, well, his, well, okay, okay, but let me, I'll just summarize it up instead of trying to quote him. Um, he's saying that what you need to do is you need to figure out what that value is and just figure out how to do a lot of that, how to go really deep um, in that. You know, if it is about interacting with other players or advancing, how do you allow people to advance in a whole bunch of different ways and advance really far, um, I think wasn't... Um, Oh, everyone's going to make fun of me for not knowing this. Skyrim. You know, that was that's a game that is like 100% about advancement, right? And then you can pick whatever tracks that you want to advance down to really make it your own game, right? Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. I've spent almost an entire work week work, work week worth of hours in the last 3 weeks playing that game and I'd say that probably pretty solidly sums it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes so you kill like, a dragon or two. <laughs> Yeah, it happens. Um, but his whole thing is like with social games right now, especially in Generation 1, it's that doesn't exist, really. Oh, I advanced so I unlocked a couple of items. Um, he's like, but right. it doesn't, you never fundamentally change the way that you play the game. It's like, just go deeper with that. And, and then his whole thing was like, what Generation 2 games are going to get better at is figuring out what's, you know, what's, in, what's that valuable for social. Maybe it's, you know, in-game interactions. Um, go deep on that in a big way and then create, start, you know, take a step back and create simple games to enable that. Don't get caught in the flash. And that was his other thing is like, you know, right now everyone's in the flash. It's like you have to probably get away from that in order to make some of these things work. Um, but just um, simple, the games will get simple. They'll become fun again. And in some ways draw some things like that. You know, it's just, it's a very simple concept. Um, it does one thing really well. It goes deep. And then eventually those types of games will start to build out. And right. more interesting. Um, so, and and his last thought, which I thought was very interesting, he goes, just like um, Yahoo was search generation one, and then Google was search generation two. Um, he doesn't think that the current leaders in the space will continue to be the leaders in the space. Yeah, that's that's pretty clear. Zynga, Zynga got really, really financially lucky and. It was not backed up with a deep understanding of what they were doing. I think that's just, unfortunately, that's painfully obvious at that point. At this point, well, um, they yeah, they did really well, and they just went, oh sweet, let's keep it going, and didn't even think. I don't yeah, think they 
took the they didn't go on a retreat and take a step back and say, Hey, where's gaming gonna be five years from now? Right. They were just running so fast, they were just like, Let's just keep going, this is awesome. It's, it's a classic gold rush, you know, thing where you know you you inundated the every you know everybody realized there was gold in California, so you know tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of people came to California, and then nobody could make money because there just wasn't enough gold to meet the demand of people that was here. Well, it's like there's a certain amount of interest, and everybody's just trying to do whatever they can, but it's like you know you're, you're you've inundated the field, you know, it's it's. Um, um, with games that, like you said, they're derivative, they're the same, and nobody likes them. And what's really frustrating about this is that, like, game, you know, it's not like we don't under, it's not like they're, it's not like we're sitting here going, man, you know what would be really awesome? Is if we could have one good example of a game that just was, like, really focused around socializing, you know, just a really strong social game that people have been playing for years and are still really interested in, and see what their model is. If only we had a game like, I don't know, <laughs> World of Warcraft <laughs> to model stuff. I'm, you sit there, oh, well, it's yeah. like, there's, this isn't a mystery. There, the, the nut has been cracked. Now what you have to do is scale it back down for a different graphics level, and you know, in, in, in and and you know, fluff it up, make it something comfortable for for parents and kids to get involved in. You know, that was the brilliance of of uh, Farmville in a large degree is that it made it comfortable for uh, a different demographic to play video games. But really and truly, you know, if you take away fight, fighting orcs and taking down castles, and you replace it with, you know, I, I don't know, um, you know building cities and drawing things, you know, in a lot of ways, that same competitive spirit, that, that fun of it, you can, you, they're, 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 the mechanics of socializing are there. You just need to figure out how to, to do it. And, you know, that's the brilliance of, of Warcraft, right? It's like, if you're not very good, you can go and just grind and get experience points. You can go on your own little quests, and then they have these big, expansive, hey, we're all going to play together and we're all going to interact. Like, it's, it, it depends, it's up to you how much you want to socialize with other people. Um, from yeah. doing nothing but social to doing nothing but, you know, single player, you know, doing your own thing. Um, you know, and I totally feel like with some of these things that that actually is the case where, or, uh, well, okay, so let's go with, like, um, Farmville as an example. I feel like you can... Like expand your plots by asking friends for help, and you know, oh, plant your seed on your friend's land, right. um, you know, and you'll be able to get land cheaper. You know, so it, it helps you go faster that way. But I, I don't feel like they do a great job of communicating. You know, hey, here are what your options are. You know, here are all the things that you could do, and you get to choose how you want to go about it and what you want to spend your time focusing on. Like you were talking yeah. about, right? I could become a master. Uh, Soybean farmer. <laughs> I don't know, but you know, become have like all the coolest soybean equipment, and you know, be able to process a lot of soybeans, or something that sounds really weird. But y you know what I mean. Um, yeah. And and go down that route. And like I like what you were talking about. You could team up with friends and say, yeah. Hey, I'm going to buy all of the harvesters. You buy all of the seed cleaners. Um, you know Somebody what I mean? buys all the land, yeah. Yeah, well, and you could and you could really team up and specialize because if you specialize, you become really good at this one thing. Right. And, you know, and together as a team, you go off and you just you know you make a killing in the soybean market or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. Or gonna, you decide to have your own little farm and you go, I'm a do-it-yourself farmer. I'm going to buy everything on my own. It's going to be all mine. Um, you know, as it means, it's going to take me a lot longer to become a you know a specialist or as efficient. Um, planting and harvesting soybean crops. Uh, right. I don't know. I just I feel like uh, you know there's so much opportunity there. Where all of a sudden you're like, wow, Farmville just got pretty crazy cool. And and if you yeah. never want to interact with other friends and just want to keep it basic, totally cool, no problem. And I would even love to see it where you could say the current model, which is, uh, have you ever played the game? Yeah, maybe someone listening hasn't. You literally get up, you have like land, you put down a plot. Um, and then you choose what you're going to plant there. And then and you got like a little guy who walks around with a shovel and he has to get around to it. And that's like what takes forever is his walking. But thankfully, they let you click ahead and he remembers where he clicked. Anyways, um, he plants it. And then you got to wait however long the, prescri the prescribed time is. And then when it's time's up, 
uh, you then get your little guy, you click on it, and he walks over, and he, um, you know, pretty much harvests it, and you're good to go. Uh, yeah. That's kind of the idea. It's very simplistic. And I could see where you go, you know what, you can put it on autopilot, and your output's going to be, you know, 75% of yeah. what, it, you know, what your max could be. But if you manage it yourself, and you curate it, and you... Uh, you know what I mean? You could add depth to it, and if you choose to do some of those things, it's going to increase your output. Uh, I, I don't. I, I just. I, you look at it and go, that could be such a cool game, something that is completely accessible by the normal standard um, casual gamer, and then yeah. something where, man, if you get into it, that could become a, a super intense game for farming. You know? And, right. You know where right. all of a sudden they're like. Oh, there was a drought this year. You got to account for it, you know. Or you know, you like to have the options like SimCity, turn off monsters and natural disasters because I don't want to deal with that. But maybe you do. And I don't know. I it has so much potential, and they're just taking the easy way out because they're just raking in the money. And as a result, people are going to get bored with it. Yeah, I think one of the things you know, one and and I can't I cannot emphasize enough. Yes, the I would idea. play that Farmville game just for the record. Yeah, that mm -hmm. sounds like fun. And and I cannot emphasize enough the idea of pacing. Um, you know, like I hate like, pacing. Oh, you know, it's yeah. If you, you I like what you said. I love what you said. If you have to pace people, you failed. Yeah, and it's funny because it's like you and I. You know, we for for those of you who are listening, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna gonna give you the details that would make this game awesome. But it would be awesome. James and I had an idea for a uh, a game that would be a simulation of political and economic stuff with countries. It's simple enough to be really enjoyable, complex enough to be really challenging, and um, you know, it would it would favor different level people. But one of the biggest challenges we always ran into was the idea that it seemed everything was turn based and the only way to kind of keep it fair was to have the turns tur turns become at regular intervals. And I would say, you know, to pace people. And um, I would say that really the only way to um, you know, the, the, for a while at least, the, you you need to just flat out reject any ideas that require pacing. If you can't play at your time as much as you want, you know, obviously, like, there's a big difference between, it's like in Skyrim, you know, for me, I have to walk, in order to discover new places, I have to walk across the world, and it's a huge Fair world. Enough which is fun, but once I get there, now I can fast travel between the two just by clicking on a button, and they have horses that I can buy so that I can, you know, in-game, using in-game money, and so I can, you know, go around faster. So it's like it's one of those things where, yeah, technically it's not, you know, really, really, you know, you know technically there's – but you quickly, you very once you've done it once, you've discovered how to do it. You don't have to do it again. And like you said, it's like it's one thing to have your guy go around farming, but once you've done it once and you know how to do it, okay. And you can also turn it on the autopilot. It's not quite the same. It doesn't have the same perks, but you know, it, it you know it'll do it still. Um, you know, and and you know, pacing. Which pacing. they do technically have that stuff. They're like, oh, hire someone to farm it for you, but it's dumb. Uh, it's clearly that is designed to for them to make money because you're lazy, um, right. or you're going on vacation and you just have no other option. Um, right. And which I'm like, no, 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 no. It should be a part of the game. Um, right. You know, dock me output. That's fine. I don't care. But right. Don't dock me real. Don't charge me real money. Or yeah, it's weird. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And that's you know, to me, I just sit there and I shrug my shoulders and I go. You know, one of the things that have some of the the greatest games that have ever been released, the games that have sold the most amount of money, you know, whether it's a first person shooter, a real time strategy, an MMORPG, it doesn't matter what your style game. The the comment people have always made is it's well balanced and it's well well paced. That is the key. Those are the two keys to a, a fantastic game. The challenges that you're meeting are well balanced to what your current thing is. You're never so overpowered that you can't defeat it, but you never overpower them where it's so, where it's easy. They're always just a little bit ahead of you, and the pacing, the rate at which you get things, the way to, rate at which you do things, by the time you've mastered a skill, a new skill is being presented to you. It's yeah. like the fundamentals of making a good game, and they've completely rejected that. Or, you know, because well, they, they don't know. Went, they never... We got one thing. Right. Okay, we're done.
That's, you yeah, know, once you master just, that, you're like, well, all right, I mastered that. Right. And it's, you know, and that's why, and that's, yeah. It's tough. I, yeah. Well, it's it's tough, but it's also been done before. That's what's so frustrating about it, is that it's like, you you know, gameplay is a is a massive field right now, and, you know, people aren't focusing on game. The first one, the first big ones that really focus on gameplay are going to change the industry, and like you said, those will be the future of the gaming companies. Which, I don't know, maybe, maybe they already exist, right? Maybe these games are already out there. We're already given examples, and what they need to do is add the social layer to it. I, you know, above and beyond what Warcraft does, or I should say, like, following Warcraft's example. You know, just right. better multiplayer types where you don't necessarily have to, you, or what I want to say, like, asynchronous multiplayer, basically. Right. Um, and well, these yeah. games already exist, and, and maybe the casual market is a totally different beast altogether, and Zynga can't keep doing the same formula over and over again. They... You know what I mean? Yeah, they got lucky on this one. Okay, it's been done. Now, unfortunately, because it's the casual market, you have to keep moving on. Keep yeah. creating simple, cheap-to-make games because they're not going to last forever. And yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe that's the. I don't know. Maybe that's the way to think about it. You know, where I could imagine if I'm trying to think like, uh, okay, if you had Skyrim, how could you add social components to that? Um, you know, or I no, the best way to look at it would be like SimCity Five. Um, where they could add social components to the game and and just have it be like the original game. It's awesome. You could do it all yourself. Or and maybe they maybe they're gonna have this. In which case, I go cool. That's you know that's social gaming right there. That's what it should be. Yes, I have to pay money to play it, <laughs> but it's a good game, so I'm going to. Unlike right. I don't know. I just. I, and maybe that's the route that you go, where you can do exactly what we talked about, right? I'm going to specialize in industrial stuff, and I've got a friend over here who's going to specialize in this, and we're going to chat, and we're going to coordinate, and we're going to figure it out, and you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I think, I think, I think a long and short of what we're trying to say here is there's a lot of different types of games that could be fun using different mechanisms, but the, in the end, the big thing is going to be big, building bigger games that are more fun. That's what's going to have you're going to yeah. have to do to have a franchise that works. And not just to stick with, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Which Zynga should have taken their initial success with Farmville and gone, oh my gosh, cool, we got a ton of money. Let's kick this up a level now. Let's, you yeah. know, let's do the deeper, let's make it more expansive, let's invest in, in new technologies other than Flash in order to make it work. Instead of saying, all right, now let's make a city version, let's make a fish version. Uh, right. You know, they, that was the wrong... Well, that was see, the wrong and, decision to make. And the worst part about it is, you know, you've see, you've seen this model before. SimCity was really successful, so they made different versions of SimCity, and it wasn't until they got back to their root game and just made a much better version of the original game that it was hugely explosively ex successful. Again, yeah. You know, and, you know, it's focus on what you do and do it better. Make it bigger. Make it more expansive and make it more fun. And then eventually it got too big and too out of control, and they had to, you know, now they're tempering it a little bit, and you know, and, but it's, you know, I don't know. It just I feel like one of the biggest problems with social gaming right now is that they've just ignored any lessons learned the hard way through the rest of the gaming industry. Which is That's because they had easy money. You know, it was man, let's make a fish version, we'll make another billion dollars. Awesome, do it. Right. And check this out, we already had the half the code made. Now what right. I gotta do is change the pictures. Yeah. And yeah, that's Zynga, they're they probably won't be around. <laughs> yeah. Ten years from now, that's my. Which is unfortunate because we know people who own their stock. <laughs> yeah, we do. All right. Yeah, you do. I guess I know them. I just don't know they own the stock. Yes. Um. Anyways, uh, good conversation, man. That was good. I appreciate it. Definitely. Um, I'm I'm excited to see that generation two and generation three to see where that goes. Um. That'll be cool. I think. I hope it'll be cool. Uh, all right, switching gears now to the tweeter. Um, so did you notice the new um, little featurette from uh, the old tweeter now? No, no, not at all. If you do the um, the money symbol and append a stalker Tim a stalker a <laughs> stock uh, symbol to it, 
um, it suddenly will become a hyperlink, just like a hashtag, and nice. um, and will then pull up uh, conversations and information from a Twitter search related to that company um, in their search engine thing. Yeah. That's so, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, one I'm part of it. There's well, the one story is that there's a company called StockTwits out there that's been doing that for a really long time. Yeah. Um, for real time stock information, um, and they got kind of upset because Twitter just kind of took it from them and didn't give them any credit or anything. <laughs> um, which I mean, that's technically that's what Twitter did with the hashtag and at replies, right? They go, we noticed that people were using this a lot, so we integrated it to make it easier. Okay, fine. Right. Um, you know, fair enough. And they're doing the same thing here. I look at that and go, is there like a like a beginning potential for more here? So you know, we've used the at symbol, we use the hash symbol, we've used the money symbol. Ah, uh, I see where you're going. This, there's the percentage. There's the little carrot. Um, there's the and ampersand. And ampersand. The star, and then I don't think the parentheses will ever be used. But um, but do you think that you know over time? They're just going to start, you know, they're going to add these special symbols. Parentheses, uh, no, no, no. So, okay, this is my thing. Reddit uses extensive use of the uh, of the star for formatting, um, which I think is actually a brilliant way to do it. They don't, it's their, they have their own special formatting thing. It's kind of like when you put uh, asterisks around a word in Google uh, chat or, or Facebook. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that, I think. Does that, that work know, in Facebook as well? I don't think it works in Facebook, but it oh, works okay. in, but like, but but it's a it's a good way to give like special markings to help you format stuff. So I could see formatting totally. become a thing. Um, that would be kind of cool. But it, you know that depends because since they since they they uh, you know they share that information with everybody, I don't know how much of that sort of thing. Unless they really wanted to push the idea of our formatting is going to be standard formatting, but that that's you know, I could see that become a thing. Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what else you would use it for, but percentages maybe. Yeah, that could be cool. I can see percentages um, in the end, in the ampersand, definitely, as uh, tags of some sort. Yeah, Tagging some yeah. specific type of information, you know. Yeah, that's cool. I like that idea. I thought you would. Um, I don't know what it would be, but I could see them. You know, they've like I said, they've got the first three, the exclamation point. I guess. Can you use that for something now? Is that that was a tough one because that gets used at the end of sentences. That'd be yeah, like that could just be a typo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other than I guess if you know that it's uh, at the beginning of of a word, right? You know, um, just like you know, then you go oh, okay. Clearly, you know, maybe it's I don't know. They could do something like that, but uh, but I think it's interesting that they're you know they're slowly they're adding. I don't want to say it. They're adding easy ways for users to provide more information or more context. In their yeah. in their tweets, um, which I think is, Clever. I think that's kind of neat. I like it. I like it. Yeah. There you go, Jinx. Boom. Um, it wasn't yeah, Jinx on my side. I said it first. Ah, <laughs> uh, sounded oh. the same on. It'll sound the same on the recording. So there you Dang go. It. Um. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, 3D printing. Have you ever done it before? Printed anything in 3D? I've watched somebody do it. All right, I've actually done it before. It's pretty cool. Um, you build all sorts of stuff, and uh, this article got written basically talking about um, the future of one one of the problems that might occur with 3D printing is the fact that it's like uh, you can you can print anything, and some dude went out and printed the body. Um, they call it the chassis of a gun. It's a very it's actually a rather small component. Um, and he, he was making, I can't remember which gun it was. It's not the M16, but it's in that same family of automatic weapons. And he got the rest of the components, the barrels, the handle, the trigger, all the springs, all, all the metal components, the bullets, the clips. He got all those things, and he just built one that well, those would all snap to and twist into and bolt to. And so basically... He was able to assemble the gun, but the chassis was plastic, plastic, and he was able to fire 200 rounds and it was still running really well because the actual explosive force of the uh, of the bullet wasn't happening in the chassis. The chassis. So wait, wait, wait. So what you're saying is he was able to buy all these other stuff like online because it's not actually the right. gun. 
Right. Not have it registered, not have it be a part of anything. Wait, wait, wait. That's all I was going to say. Oh, you're, you're, you're jumping ahead. What I was oh, about I'm to sorry. say was I'm sorry. I'm sorry. the reason why this is important is because the chassis is what actually gets the – is what you register. From, the, wow. from, from a legal perspective, the chassis is what's considered the gun. Everything else are just components that snap onto it. So okay. that's actually what you register. That's what you – know, that was what has the ID on it. Yeah, so we – we can print those. I was reading this. I read the article, and they were like, 3D printing could make you know gun control impossible. It's like, that's stupid. And you're like, when are we going to have metal printing? Like, yeah, that's obviously the future, but it could be another 20 years before it gets good enough to fire a gun. And then you read this guy that's already done it, and you're like, oh, well, that's actually a thing. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. And so they, this is, I don't, we don't really have time to get into this, but um, something to think about is the future of 3D printing comes barreling down the, uh, um, the, the path of this, like, you know, what are we, what are we going to do with 3D printing? Are there going to be certain things that you're not legally allowed to print, like, which I think is like crazy. Like print a knife type of thing? Yeah, exactly, you know, hmm. but, or, you know, I don't know, an unregistered gun. <laughs> um it's, it works pretty well for that example, you know. It's uh, it's very practically, you know, it's very practical. It's a very practical example of the issue of 3D printing. Um, you know, I, I don't actually know if it's, I don't think it's illegal to build a chassis, um, your, your homemade chassis. Uh, you uh-huh. can, I don't, I'm, I believe that's not illegal, so I can't imagine why it would be. But all of a sudden you could manufacture in very simply, you know, if 3D printers become common enough where they have them at Kinko's, they like, load up your program, print off your gun, go back home, (laughs) put your gun together, (laughs) go shoot stuff. It's kind of, it's crazy. It's crazy. The future is exciting. I can't wait to see, you know. You see, that's what I love about technology, right? I mean, you get all this legislation and all these arguments and then, Technology comes along and just kind of blows up <laughs> the entire <laughs> conversation, you know, and just flips it on its head and you go, well, that, now we have to completely think about it differently. I, I, I realize that this one's a weird example to say that, but, but that's one of the cool things about technology. I'd love to see that in uh, something similar happen for voting and political uh, interaction with elected people or, yeah. you know, even just community decisions that get made. I think there's... There's a lot of potential there, and this is a, a very weird example of how that works. Where you just—I right. mean, we've talked about that with patents too, right? Where just right. It, it there was this system in place, and technology is kind of just crumbling those ideas and norms all of a sudden, and you go, "Whoa, right. we got to rethink this." The only hope right. is that uh, this one's a weird one again to say this, um, but the people making the rules have an open mind about it and are willing to, in some ways, to go down that path to say, "Well, well let's explore this and see where it goes." Right. Um, again, it's. It's weird to be saying that about some guy making a gun, but um, yeah, just generally speaking. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and and the idea that you know one day, probably in the near future, uh, it may not be Kinkos, but you'll be able to you'll be able to go. You know, you'll be there are actually no place where they have three printers, and you can go. It's a big. It's an. It's an. You. It's like a. You buy a membership like you would a gym, but it's a workshop, and they have wood tools and metal tools and and 3D printers. And I mean, like, what's to stop you from walking up and printing off a gun and you know yeah. having an unregistered? I don't know. It's crazy. It's just a like, and like you said, it just kind of blows up. Like we have all these strategies, we have all these ideas, we have all these plans, and then like technology comes around and just smacks you in the face, like ah, <laughs> you know. And it and the crazy part yeah. about it is, you know, the thing that makes it more complicated is a pretty big article written this week. Um, that I, I didn't link to, but um, where they were basically talking about the idea that uh, trying to stop pirating is like playing a game of whack-a-mole where the moles are constantly digging more holes and they already have plans for expansion that they haven't shared with the whackers. And you know, they're basically like, you know, they, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, yeah, you can keep shutting down different ventures and venues and you can even get really expansive... Um, you know, stuff, but until you just start straight up monitoring, well, even if you just started, you know, controlling and monitoring monitoring every bit of data, the guys that are building the technology are smarter than you, and they'll just disguise it, and mm-hmm. you'll be out of luck, you know, and, and it's just one of those, like, oh, 
well then, <laughs> that's, that's frustrating. <laughs> Cause it's, and they're like, yeah, it's just this simple, that's the thing. If people want to do it enough, the technology, the people designing the technology and building the technology, they're smarter than the people regulating the technology. And, um, you know, which calls into very, the very question of, you know, how do you regulate this and who's going to regulate this? And, and I think future generations will be more equipped for it just because you'll have people who grew up with that sort of a thing, um, and they'll be the ones wrestling mm-hmm. this to the ground. But definitely for the next 20 years, it's like, you know, how do you how do you stop a criminal from walking into a machine shop with an open 3D printer from printing off a gun? You know, which I don't think anybody's a fan of <laughs> that idea. Um, you know, but it's it's a it's a big question now. Oh, it's crazy. That is pretty crazy. 3D printing. Who would have thought? Yeah. Something so cool. I like it. All right, here's a question for you. What does a tragic history of hate crimes, Google Glasses, the first quantum router, and a Ferrari 458 driver um, have in common? They've all been tweeted about through Facebook. Probably, yes. Okay. Um, the other thing that they hold in common is that they are all currently on the front page of the new dig. Oh, baby. Have you had an opportunity to check it out? I did. Um, you didn't tell me to, but I was going through our list of articles, and I saw the new dig. I was like, new dig. And I, I, I headed over there, and uh, yeah, sure new enough. dig. It's a new dig. So what do you think of the new digs? Uh, it is it's no different. longer what it used to be, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, it's, so it if you haven't been there yet, um, go there. There's basically three sections on the front page. Um, the top stories, which is more like just a Pinterest. I w- is that how you would describe it? It's got a yeah. picture, um, the kind of like the tag, I guess, uh, the the title, who it's from, and then a little um, caption thingy, which, from what I understand, is partially curated by a real human being. Um, it's very clean, um, mostly white, so I immediately like it. The, uh, the second section are the popular posts, um, the ones that are somehow different than the top ones. I don't know how that works, but uh, they're different. And, and one of the cool things is they show you like the dig volume of uh, clicks over time. Now, let's I say, like that. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? And then it also shows you up and coming, which just tells you the total number of digs. It doesn't actually have a, uh, you know, um, graphs associated with it. Now, let's say that you find an article that you like. Uh, you sign in with Facebook. That's your currently your only um, way of signing in. And you go, oh, full moon rises through Tower Bridges Olympic rings. I dig that. I'm guessing it's a picture. Um, the second you do that, it goes, good job. It's been dug and shared on your Facebook wall. It automatically shares it to my Facebook wall. Yep. I hate that. I yeah, that was uh, that was me. <laughs> um, I don't. I didn't honestly. I did not spend a whole lot of time to see seriously to turn that off. Yeah, because if that's not like you went from going, wow, man, I might actually, I might check this out. It just looks really nice. It looks like a cool place to get information. I literally went from that attitude to well, I'm never gonna use it <laughs> in. Yeah, so second. let's see here. I just signed in, went to settings. Um, there's three choices here. I can say I can sign out from Facebook, I can update my email, or I can delete my account. Um, well, yeah. I don't, what happens if I hit this Twitter button? Oh, it'll take me to the Digs Twitter page. Nice. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, now remember they did make this in like six weeks, so they don't have like every single feature on there, which, you know, this done in six weeks, that in itself is pretty impressive. Um, yeah. But you can still submit a link. You can subscribe to different things. Um, yeah, that's the only real downside of it is it automatically shares it on Facebook, which I know what they're thinking, right? It's the viral effect. It's awesome. Yeah, um, but I hate it. Turn that off. It's or the same reason why I, it's the same. I had to, I fought my way, I battled my way through Spotify so that nobody can ever see what music I'm listening ah. to before I was willing to use their service. Um, man, I, I, I think that it's a, you know, it was, if you, if you, you know, because, because I, you know, yeah, most of the time I don't care what, what people think I'm interested in, but sometimes I want to be like, nah, 
I, I don't, I don't, I don't, especially Facebook, because it's like, you know, for people like us, where we actually use that as a platform for the show, um, I, it's, it's public, so people I work with can see it, like, I definitely, and I don't want to have to manage all of that garbage on the Facebook end, in order uh, to, no, I just want to know that whatever gets, especially because Facebook changes your security parameters sometimes. Oh, no, yeah, just I make just, it sharing always explicit. That's for, always been my, I will share yeah. most things, but I want to explicitly do it. Yeah, I, know, I just want, yeah, I want to click to share. I, I think that that's a, well, and maybe what their argument is, is the dig is the share button now, but I think that's the wrong attitude. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just need to use Dig as a... Maybe I just need to be a lurker and um, just lurk on Dig if I'm going to use it. Uh, you know, not Yeah, the other weird thing is um, you may not care given your screen size, but there are pixels. It's like 120 pixels wide, which I have my browser at like 1,000 pixels, which works awesome for everything uh, except for Dig. Did you just burn my... Screen size as being small. No, no, no. I'm saying you might have a fall. You might. I purposely make mine smaller. That's all I'm saying. So yours might be bigger. Okay. Don't worry. I, w I wasn't. I wasn't trying. I wasn't trying to, make you fun. <laughs> trying to make fun of my screen size. Okay, good. No, I was just saying you might do like full screen, in which case it doesn't matter. It's gonna be. Right. It's gonna fill up the it's, screen. Whatever. Yeah, but anyway, it, it looks cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't be digging anything because of that. But um. Once they take that off, I'll probably visit again when I'm, you know, bored. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, definitely. Mo looks nice. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Okay. So, um, have you, uh... I'm trying to think about what I want to talk about next, because I have tons of things. Um, I'm going to say, go for it, man. Whatever okay. you want. I'm going to go popcorn style. Just you're along for the ride now. Okay. Um, hey, do you have $80 on you? Uh, n on me? No. Because if you did, you could buy the Protean Echo, which Echo. is a credit card that allows you, through advanced technology magic, um, to store three credit cards on it. And then depending nice. on the button you tap, it becomes that credit card. So, nice. if you're like me, where I just, I literally, I only carry three credit cards with me, which is, pr which is, exactly two credit cards or two cards more than I want to carry. Um, this would be like, cool, one, love it. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, um, like it literally changes the magnetic strip in a way to make it work. They're like, the only weird part would be if they want to see like your signature or your ID or something and they're like, what is this magic? Because they're like, basically, it's a really slick looking card sniffer. Um, <laughs> but you know, but the idea is you would use it for your own cards only because it doesn't tell you what not to use. Um, right. But I just thought that and I was like, dude, that is awesome. It's That's a good looking a, card. Uh, Protean Echo. Yeah, I bet it would turn a bunch of heads. The only problem is that it's eighty bucks. That's a lot of money for only three cards. If they could yeah. set it up where it was like every single card in your wallet, throw it on here. I'd be like, okay. That's legitimately Dude, it's awesome. as thin as a credit card. Give them a couple years. <laughs> you know, the nice part about it is every eighteen months the technology every eighteen months the technology, you know, number of transistors doubles. So realistically, I mean, and this like honestly, you could expect that in you know in eighteen months there'll be six, and in three years it'll be able to handle it to you know twelve cards. They you got know, enough. They got enough spaces for dots. Um, on it, I think. But yeah, it's. I just thought that was cool. It's an Uber card. Yeah, that's very one. cool. That okay. is very cool. And I'm I, uh, cheap, so. And I, I only have one card that I ever use, so. Wouldn't but there be you go. I, <laughs> I used to have one, and that was it. And then, through some changings and business stuff, now I have three, and that's sad. But my wallet is still super thin, so I'm not complaining too loudly. Um, you would like this one. Okay. Uh, there was a, a an update from our friends over at Wahooli. Wahooli. Yeah. Um, so one of the so as we've talked about, anyone who's and, listening and, to the podcast. Knows. And yeah, and we want to point out the fact that they are our friends over at Wahooli. We're actually <laughs> we're actually friends with them because they talk to us. Check out the interview; yeah. it was really good. Exactly. Um, just in case you missed it, though, the basic idea is that they have figured out a way to trade um, the equity for... So companies give up equity 
to um, individuals who uh, basically will tweet about them, share about them, you know, spread the word about them. So it's a way of trading advertising dollars for equity because companies may have equity to give away, uh, but no advertising dollars or very little advertising dollars. And so they can do that and customers get to, or advocates, I guess, get to share in the success. One of the problems um, with that model is how do you know that the company giving away equity is a legit company? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's fair, right? You and I could be like, we've come up with a company called Magic Dust that magically makes you fly when you think a happy thought. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and we Dude, could be I like, saw a movie about that. Exactly, that's, that's why it's real. That's, why, that's how you know it's real. And <laughs> or, or a hoverboard, man. They did, all, they did it in that one movie. <laughs> all we got to do is make it hover. We got the board. We're done. It's practically there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Ali G Show, for anybody who's wondering. Uh, um. That was amazing, yes. So, um, so Wahooli has teamed up with a service called CapLinked that will help them do the due diligence to make sure that the companies they're bringing in are legitimate companies. Um, you know, typically if like a venture capitalist, they would do the due diligence themselves, but their hoping is to, you know, bring in lots and lots of companies, kind of Kickstarter right. style, if you will, um, in the sense that it's just a lot of people or a lot of companies. Um, and this is one way that they'll be able, they're outsourcing that part of it, basically, to have CapLinked who, um, does uh, what's how would I describe them? Um, their tools help small businesses manage complex financial transactions. Is the idea? Um, yeah. So basically, you can they'll just help out with the vetting process, I guess, of those companies to make sure that they're legit. Uh, so it's cool to see that they're um, you know they're still making progress and making their company even better. Yeah, I mean it's it has always seemed like a a uh, definitely a good idea, you know, with but you know not perfect and you know yeah they're they're slowly hacking away at you know potential issues. It's cool. And I I like the, the final sentence here from Pando Daily, uh, or final two sentences. Sorry, it says of course with the security of the due diligence being taken care of by CapLinked, the real challenge for Wahulu for I'm sorry Wahuli will be picking the right companies. You know the hard part. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, that's really one of the impressive parts about Wahooli, in my opinion, is how often they – there are a lot of different aspects that could make their business better, and they, they don't have any hesitation in reaching out to other companies that are already doing that well and integrating that service into theirs, you know, whether it be – you know, because it's like they early on they only wanted to pick users that would actually be helpful, so they went through clout, which a lot of people don't like clout, but it's a pretty good way of finding people with – Social reach, um, and uh, you know, and uh, um, which, by the way, Uli, I've now passed my my clout number is high enough where I, <laughs> I you can you can automatically induct me anytime. Um, <laughs> and nice. uh, um, but you know, but it's you know they've they they there 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 are only a few tasks that they are they keep dedicated in house. This is our core competency. And yeah, they're totally. Really, really focused on that. That's I think that to me is one of the thing that things that makes it such a potentially awesome company is they don't pretend to be good at other stuff. There are a few things that they're good at that they that they really want to focus on having that be their core competency, and everything else they'll go out and get somebody else who does it better, and and they're not afraid to. You know, let them share part of the pie. It's, it's a good company. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see them continue to grow. Mm-hmm. Totally. And finally, um, because one of our commenters wants to know, are you uh, going to stay up and watch the seven minutes of terror? What? <laughs> the which is the um, the informal title for what's happening later this evening. What? It's your article, dude. <laughs> Wait, oh, oh, uh, the Mars lander touchdown? Is that what yeah. we're talking about? Yeah, uh, well, so this is the thing. I've been like hardcore Olympics, and Usain Bolt is like my favorite of all time. So it sort of depends on when NBC 
decides to get around to it. I might I might be dual streaming because they're gonna live stream it. Except the only problem is is that <laughs> NASA expects like a thousand people to be live streaming it, and it's down on the front happen. page of Reddit, which means it's just gonna be a uh, hundred billion people. It was and, also on the French page of Dig, so you can add another thousand. Right. Yeah. It's just gonna it's gonna absolutely demolish their uh, their ability to stream it. So I feel like if you're not watching Plus, it on we TV, mentioned it here. So I mean, you right, add it's, that that's, too. Exactly. That's a certain number of people. Um, I don't know how many people. <laughs> um, but not as many uh, as Reddit. Let's yeah, put it that probably. Way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, we're working on it. Um, and we just need uh, to get into those uh, Facebook ads to start exactly. hitting it hard. Yeah, man. Get some help. Likes. Facebook stock price. Woo. Um, but yeah. So I have this. Like, I feel like I have a choice. I either get to watch the same Bolt run, who like I've been you know, excited about seeing him run for four years or I get to <laughs> get to watch the Mars Lander touchdown, which I've been excited about for four years. The thing is, um, I feel like if I don't watch the the uh, evening broadcast of, on NBC, it might be another, you know, 16 years before they give that video away for people to watch, whereas it'll be it'll be live archived from through NASA right away. So I'll probably watch the Mars Lander tomorrow. <laughs> Which I know is super lame, but um, you know, Usain Bolt's my man. He's my boy. He's a nutcase and I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I I understand. I understand. Since I do not have the option to watch the Olympics, um Assuming I'm home, I'll probably watch it. Cool, cool. Definitely. It's at, uh, just for those of you who wanted to know, it's at um, 3.30 p.m. AEST. I have no clue what that stands for. Um, American Eastern Standard Time? I don't know. Basically, it's 10.30 p.m. Pacific Time. <laughs> you can do your math from there. Oh, yeah, dude. I'm definitely not going to watch it. Pacific Standard Time? That's what we're doing? That's where that's where we are, yeah. right? Yeah, because I'll, yeah. I'll definitely be watching the Olympics. Uh, bummer. They're gonna play that. It's that's at ten thirty at night, dude. The hundred meter finals they go super late. They the the live broadcast wow. doesn't end until like one o'clock in the morning, and they always Whoa. yeah. Oh, you it's mean awful, not the man. live yeah, the post live broadcast, but yeah. Yeah, the evening the replay, broadcast. Put it that way. Yeah. The one okay. where they have right. edited oh, out all the cool stuff. Yeah, it is very late. It's kind of frustrating, but. Whatever, you know. Oh. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So this guy, it's um from what I've read, it's not like a guarantee that it's gonna actually land on Mars. The chances of it happening are actually pretty slim, which is probably why it's the seven minutes of terror, right? Right. I, I And then can't once it's why. there, it'll begin taking three hundred and sixty degree panorama images. That then takes three days to arrive on Earth. <laughs> yeah. So wait a second. So will it have already landed by the time we watch it? How does that work? No, no, no. What we're doing is we we they've got all sorts of satellites and stuff positioned like oh. crazy, and then they have oh, those supposed to be like high quality images. Right. Huh? The first, yeah, the so the long. first images okay. are like they have like a they have like a super low quality black and white mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. camera that'll take a couple images just to say hey. Our our transmitter is working, and then they've got a couple satellites that they're that they're going to be watching it with. It's a big, it's like it's like this hugely orchestrated thing that they're doing. Um, it's crazy that we have enough cameras over there now where we can actually watch it from a bunch of different angles and make That's see what happens. Yeah, and, well, and the cool part about that is, you know, uh, you know, uh, this is this is you, you hate saying this, but you you almost learn as much from a from a mishap as you do from a. Um, from a success, you know, so it's and sometimes more. So it's, you know, one of the big things here is now that we'll watch it, we'll get all the internal information, we'll know what's happening, and hopefully, you know, next time we send something, we'll we'll be even better prepared to, to land it because it won't just be its internal sensors that we're relying on. We'll also be, you know, watching it. So, oh, pretty cool. Wow. So pretty it's, it's, taken, it's taken eight and a half months to go 567 million kilometers. Sounds pretty far. Um, they're aiming for a crater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're like, hopefully we'll get near it. And it weighs about 900 kilograms. And it's named Curiosity. Yeah. Curious. Hmm. And it can <laughs> cost them, uh, let's see here, 
two and a half billion dollars so far. Yeah, it's pretty expensive. <laughs> that's one of the big reasons. That's where the terror in those seven minutes come from. <laughs> yeah, wow. Interesting. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully it works out. Fingers crossed, NASA. Yeah, yeah. We'll be watching afterwards. Um, so, anything else going on in your life? Do, 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 anything else going on in my life? Oh, not a lot. Not a lot okay, at this point. Not. I got a new, uh, I got a new pair of headphones coming. Um, my old ones that kept all the sound. Wait, what out, happened so to your skull candy things? My skull candy, the uh, manufacturing defect. The oh. the plug didn't work, so I sent them to them. Just mailed it to them, and they checked it out, and it's covered by their their warranty. They actually have a pretty cool warranty program. If it's a manufacturing discount or uh, manufacturing de defect, they'll give you a full refund on the headphones. Um, and uh, if it's a if it's a defect because you were playing too hard, as they explain, basically you broke it, they'll give you 50% credit. Um, and so I uh, I sent it back. They got the, the qualified for the man for the warranty. Um, and I, I upgraded. One hundred percent version. Yeah, I upgraded. Got a little bit nicer pair too. So hopefully wow. they'll be. Uh, I'll have. I'll have nice headphones and I'll look cool and sound cool and I won't have any echoing going on, which sometimes happens. And when with my <laughs> my super cheap sports headphones. Cool. Awesome. So, yeah, I like it. Um, I'm just enjoying the heat. It was like 100 degrees yesterday, and it's pretty, probably pretty close to that right now. Here, let me look on my magic phone device. <laughs> it rained for five minutes yesterday here. Yeah, uh, it says it's only 82. feels like it should be warmer. Um, so there you go. Just enjoying the outside, the outdoors. That's what I've been doing. Nice. All right, dude. Cool. Good, good podcast today. I like Definitely. this. Definitely. Good conversations all around. For the middle of summer, there's a lot of interesting things going on. <laughs> We're like solidly in the dog days of August, and it's a. Uh... Well, it's almost like the companies finished their quarterly earnings. You know, that was like that's what happened last week, and now they're right. like, okay, now we can actually start doing interesting things again. All the finance stuff is out of the way. Yeah. Even though I'd managed to have a couple business stories hidden in there, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I should say it's really now that they've done all of that and people have had a little bit of time to sit back and think. Now the interesting thoughts come. Exactly. About, you know, where the future's headed, which is what we like to talk about. So, cool. Hey, man. Thanks for um, thanks for being here. Everybody else, uh, thank you for listening. We truly, truly appreciate it. Um, you are what helps makes this fun. So, um, again, I am James Furlow, and... My fastest astronaut in the world brother is Matthew Furlow, and we will be talking next time. For realsies. All right, man. Have a great evening. I'm off to go play a softball game. Go dominate. And Have fun, but not too much fun. Okay, whatever that means. <laughs> um, yeah, bye. All right, man. Bye.